Good evening. I'd like to bring the um, new fall 13 Board of Education meeting to order. This is a regular meeting September 10th. And uh, I would like to welcome my colleagues back and administration who's been here and uh, all of you in the audience. So welcome. With that, I'd like to start with public audience. Anyone in the audience wishing to address the board may do so. All right, seeing none, we will move on to board and administrative communications. And as always, we start with our student representative, Jacob. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to have you back. Good to be here. Good. So uh, the high school is sort of the beginning of the year, as you can probably well imagine. So it's pretty crazy. Lots of students still changing their schedules and stuff. Um, the first home football game is tomorrow night, uh, 7 o'clock on the turf. So it's big first home game, hopefully good season. Um, FBLA has its first meeting tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. And uh, the One Axe uh, Theater competition is uh, just getting started as well. Their auditions are coming up soon. And so they're getting organized. So it's sort of a little bit of a grasp of what's going on at the high school right now. Good, great. good, Thank great. You. Good start to your senior year. Great, Thank good, thank you. Susan. Uh, welcome back. That's about all. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like we never left. Tom. Same. Same. Todd. Nothing for tonight. Chris. Nothing, Lydia. Nothing tonight, Lydia. Thanks. Tara. Um, I don't have much. I did want to mention, though, that Central School hit its 100th birthday on on Wednesday, Happy September birthday. 4th. Yes. And, um, <laughs> Kate has been working very hard on the committee. Um, and we had a great, there was a great uh, assembly for the students, but the townwide um, event will be November 3rd on Sunday, and it'll be a huge open house for anyone who wants to come, anybody who has interesting stories and tales who would like to tell them pre, before, please call Central School Office and uh, share anything you want, and, and, and if you want to, um, if you have any good thoughts about it, but it'll be a fun, full day of excitement and reminiscing about the history of Central School. And it's open to everybody um, in the town because it's a pretty big accomplishment to have a school continuously run for 100 years. Absolutely. And absolutely. And I understood you buried the time capsule. The time capsule was buried on the 4th as well. And uh, okay, other time capsules weren't ever found. The plastic, I think, will be a little easier. The tin cans, I think, are long gone. <laughs> and they're filled with treasures. But um, no, so it's, it's, it's an exciting time. And uh, it's a big birthday for. Central School. It was really a nice assembly, and Mary uh, Glassman came and gave a proclamation. And, uh, nice. Nice. Very neat. The kids were very excited. Kids are very excited, and the teachers are very excited. It's a real good feeling. And good. Good, good, good. Now more everybody in town should come on the 3rd, because it will be third. a very fun day. Yeah. It's a Sunday. It's all day. It's, you know, it'll be a Great. nice event. Well, we hope, we, we hope the uh, public will come and support Central Schools 100th. So, more importantly, do we know where the time capsule is buried? <laughs> now we do, yeah. <laughs> see how long that documentation lasts. With a magnet. Yeah, with a magnet. <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah. a magnet. and any alumni should come, too, because there are a lot of alumni in town who yeah, that's went great. through those halls. Oh, that's great. I'm sure they will. Good. Thank you. Good. Erin. I do. I have two things. I, we had a great opening uh, as we welcomed our new teacher, or all our teachers and new teachers uh, back to school in August. I just want to update you on our August professional development activities. We had uh, two hours where teachers had opportunities to work in their grade level and or department time uh, following a faculty meeting that all the principals held. And then the four hour session that we had the day before school opened was on our new teacher evaluation system. We had done about 12 hours of professional development development with teachers back starting last spring and we followed it up again for teachers to begin writing their own professional growth plans uh, at the start of the school so we kicked off the year with that with and we had done some work with our new teachers as well so everybody was somewhat on the same mm -hmm. page in mm -hmm. which to get started so it was a great opening in that way getting people back and focused on the work that they were doing likewise I have two things in your folder that I would just draw your attention to one is the um, Simsbury Arts Academy, the fall brochure, and I hadn't looked at it until I opened it. You need a magnifying glass to read the inside oh, of it. Wow. But there are lots of great oh. opportunities that will be made available <laughs> okay. if you can read the <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I don't know what All size right. font that is, but. <laughs> <laughs> 
okay. and the uh, other document, <laughs> go. the other document is an important one from the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, NEASC, as we know it, that uh, comes in every 10 years to do an evaluation at our high school. And they had, uh, on June 23rd, they did a uh, review of our pre-study, um, pre pre-self-study report and um, have continued our accreditation which is really good news and that we are up for reevaluation again in the year the calendar year of 2016 so we don't know whether that will be the spring or the fall of 2016 so we're in good standing and we will just wait until all of the um, preliminary work begins for that 10-year evaluation that will occur in 2016 so we really don't have to start any preliminary work we're in, until we're in good your hands right until now. that great we are good all right Burke I have two uh, financial items uh, <coughs> this evening the first is uh, some news that's uh, in the board's packet from Kerma which is our Connecticut inter interlocal risk management agency it's a self, uh, governed member governed um, insurance company for towns and cities in our in our uh, state and what's becoming somewhat of an annual event is that we uh, received a member's equity check for $5,539 for the past year. And uh, that's about 17000 over the last three years in um, checks that we have received back for the positive per um, performance of our group. So that's Great. good news mm -hmm. and, and uh, we're happy to um, report that. The town uh, of Simsbury is also a part of that and received uh, a check also. Awesome. Good. Uh, um, hey, hey, Burke. Th yes. th this is uh, workers' comp. Is that what this? Uh, what lines of coverage? It's, what lines of coverage? It's, all, it's our liability, auto, property. Um, well, as well as our workers' comp. Okay. Thank yep. you. Thank you. They handle it all for us. All right. And um, the second item had had to do uh, with our our annual audit that Bloom Shapiro does. We have a, a kickoff meeting every summer that's attended by a representative of uh, Board of Finance, Board of Education, um, Board of Selectmen, and then staff, financial staff. Tom Dorn was, uh, was there again for the second year representing the Board of Education this, this summer. Um, the auditors will be coming later on this, this, this fall. But one of the conversations that came out of that um, meeting was to uh, expand the focus for the auditors expand their scope of work a bit to, to some of the other um, departments both in the town and um, Board of Education to do some uh, additional what's called agreed upon procedures and those uh, the focus uh, that, that we are supporting uh, happening and the Board of Finance is trying to get uh, finalized is to just do some uh, work in all seven schools with the activity funds. The, act the activity funds are, are, are there to accept donations and, and uh, uh, taking fees for for various things, but just you know, this will give us uh, some recommendations on how we can strengthen um, our receipts and, and cash uh, disbursement processes. So something that we're supportive of, and just we'll be confirming to the uh, board of finance that this is a good thing to do moving forward. As you may um, recall, <coughs> um, Kira Sheehan was hired about a year and a half ago to uh, work in our office as our accountant and budget analyst. So this is an area she's been working with all of our schools on over the past year or so, and this just supports and strengthens uh, the work that she does. So if any other questions or comments, that's uh, essentially the, the uh, uh, message we'll be confirming back to the Board, board of Finance. Finance. Okay, good. Brooke, I, I, didn't, uh, I know we had our initial meeting. I didn't get a sense of timing. From any of that stuff, did you have you gotten timing? I yet? have not. I've seen a, I've seen the um, draft scope, and um, that was that was not clear to me whether I mean it would make sense that they would do it when they're already right. out and they they'll be doing their um, their work in the uh, latter part of November. Okay. So unless I hear otherwise, I'm going to assume it's going to happen in that time frame. But I still need to verify that. Okay. Good. Thank you, Tom, for sure. participating in that. So, good, good fun over the summer, yeah. yeah. Auditing, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, what you live for. It's great. Uh, well, you're just the right yeah. board member to, to 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 do that, be in that committee. Appreciate so, that. good, good. That's all I have. All right, Mr. Curtis. Hello. Yeah, just wanted to reiterate as, as Aaron did. I think we had a very positive opening. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, when we get to the school opening report. Did want to share that I was just uh, I was very moved by the the speech of our teacher of the year. Uh, Betty Lakota, who uh, 39 years, 
uh, being a teacher here within the Simsbury Public Schools and really framed her comments around the theme of who am I and why am I here uh, mm -hmm. with the first slide uh, being a picture of her as a kindergartner at Terrafield School 53 years mm -hmm. ago and that she's had 53 <laughs> first days of school in Simsbury. And I think it was just uh, a, a theme that was very passionate and very in alignment with what we really stand for and, and the quality of our staff and commitment level. So I wanted to uh, share that and thank uh, thank Betty for that. Uh, the other piece um, I wanted to share is we're going to continue with SCTV uh, this year on kind of a monthly uh, TV spot and um, Neil has just filmed a spot with uh, Dane Street, our Director of Athletics um, and Student Activities, which will be uh, coming up talking about some of the new programming and, and questions, question and response about things in areas of interest with athletics. So we'll continue to do different topics uh, throughout the year. Good. And this is our third segment that we're doing? That we've third done or third or fourth, third right? Or right. Yeah. So we've done several yeah. segments on very right. various we did school climate. climate. We did uh, facilities and enrollment. Uh, we did a segment also on um, introducing some of our new administrative staff. Right. Technology. Technology. Technology as well. Technology. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Good. So this is a, a great outreach for the community to find out about Sinsbury Public Schools. Good. Right. Very good. That's it. Good. All right. So um, first, just uh, I got two, two little things. Um, in your folders, you have the hot topics. Um, probably a hot topic from Cabe, unless I'm the only one that got that. It was about, um, it is canceled. It was the one for September 18th. Did they get it or just me? Just, just me. All right. Well, it was a hot topic. Um, Cabe uh, sponsors these, just came to me, for um, September 18th. And unfortunately, it was had to, uh, it's canceled, but um, it was about the pre-K and, and the state's uh, role now in school boards and, and pre-K initiatives. So um, this will be rescheduled um, because the speakers could not make it and I will let you know. So we have a series of, of hot topics throughout K which are, are going to be um, applicable to, to all boards and, and board members moving forward with um, school reform and school initiatives. So I will keep you posted on that. Um, the other thing I'd just like to remind my fellow board members here is that you probably um, also received the, um, the event that's going to be placed uh, by KSEC and maybe administration can talk further on this on September 19th and uh, this is a suicide prevention intervention training program so if any of you are interested um, please register with uh, Mickey LaCour's Beckett at Social Service. This is the first time that we are going to be, that is, this will be offered um, through KSEC, which is the Connecticut Association of Substance Abuse Council, and uh, the director is Tom Steen, one of our former parents, and uh, he will be presenting there. So it, it went out to uh, all boards and, and in commissions and, and uh, school school personnel, so it will be will be of um, of interest, and in, it's a home morning workshop to uh, somehow get a get a better understanding of um, suicide prevention and, and, and what is going on within our community, our schools, and in our in our neighborhoods. So that's it. The other, I just uh, last night I attended briefly the um, the charrette. It was um, as you know, it was going on the charrette concerning the um, Hartford insurance. So the consultants were there, and and I was asked just to come in and speak with the consultants regarding the board of education's. Um, interest in, in, in what is going on and obviously we do have an interest in that as, as you all know with the loss of Hartford Insurance and the loss of the tax, tax revenue. So I, I spoke with the uh, one of the principal consultants about that and uh, reiterated again what other um, town officials have reiterated, especially Board of Finance, as we go into budget season starting in, in November. So it was important for them to to know where we sit. And, and again, it tonight is the follow, following follow up final presentation that they will be having. It's going on right now as we speak, of uh, presenting what has happened in the past several days. They've had community input. Um, they've had um, very different stakeholders, you know, come and talk about, about what, what is um, what they would like to see in that property and what is the best use of of that property so um, so that was it so I did um, did speak with them and, and, uh, and let them know that you know superintendent is available in central office if they have any further questions about the role of, of, of Simsbury Public Schools and Board of Education in the process so that is it all right so moving along we are on to recommended actions exhibit one um, I'd like to make a comment yes I was present at that meeting <coughs> If you could just pop my name in there, I'd appreciate it. All righty. Very good. Okay. That. Do I hear a motion? This is uh, June 11th? Yes. I'll make a motion. June, reg, June 11th regular meeting. I'll make a motion for the minute. Second. Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? 
All right. Motion All right. passes. All right. Approval of minutes of June 28, Exhibit 2. It seems like yesterday we were here. Do I hear? Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Motion passes. All right. We are on to personnel. Can we? No, 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 more. more. Is it another? Oh, I'm sorry. Jul oh, July 26. Approval of minutes of July 26 special meeting. So moved. All I right. have a comment. Um, under recommended actions A, um, we need to put assistant principal. Appointment of Sinsbury High School assistant principal. It, it says that. It says this right it here. Okay. It says it on your copy? Yeah, it does on mine. Good. Excellent. Oh, it says on my copy too. Right here. Okay. <laughs> it does say. Pardon? It was. <coughs> right. Thank you. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Very good. Um, do you have a motion on the table? Yeah, right there. Second. Do you have a motion? I move. Susan, second. Tom. Oh, Any other discussion? Here. We're all set. Motion passes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Terry, you have a question? Well, uh, yeah, so what did we just approve? June 28th, correct? Yes. June, right. Yeah. Special yeah. July 20, July, July, 26. July 26. That was our special July meeting. Because mine doesn't say, mine. my copy says, exhibit three, it says. Keep reading. It's in the motion. It's in the, the motion. It's correct. Right. It's right. It's right. Yeah, I'll the motion's correct. Right, okay. Very good. All right. All, all set? Are you, are you okay, Tara? I'm You're feeling better. Right. She's good. <laughs> First meeting yeah. back, you know. No. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're not going to do this all the time, right? I have to make a little trouble. Uh, absolutely. I mean, see, this is what happens when you have a short summer <laughs> away, from, away from one another. Okay. Katie, got all that? Good. All right. We are on to personnel, Exhibit 4. Yes. In <clears throat> Sue's absence, I will do the, uh, the personnel exhibits this evening. Uh, first are uh, employees that have put in their notice of intent to retire within three years. So I'd ask the, that the board make the motion uh, to accept the notice of intent to retire of Bridget Anuli, Betty Lakota, Joanne Mitchell, Tom Centino, Marilyn Straylau, effective June 30th, 2016. Do I hear a second? No. Second. We need a motion. motion. Make a motion. Tara made a motion. Second. Mike second. Susan, any discussion? I think we have to commend and just be so thankful that they were all here for so long and serve and were so great for our community and our district. It's a huge loss to That's lose so this huge, right. when you look all at this talent. Ears, it's ridiculous it talent. It's amazing. And Absolutely. they were all wonderful to so many kids and such an influence, such a positive influence on so many students. Absolutely. We appreciate it. And I think this and we still have a couple years. Yes. 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 <laughs> we do. Yeah. Thank right. goodness. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely right. I mean, it's quite a, quite a list. So say thank you for the next three years. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, Terry, you made a motion? Yes, I did. Second? No, here, second. Susan, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. We're on to. There was uh, one retirement over the summer that we would ask the board to um, make a motion to accept the retirement of Deborah Leach, effective July 31st, 2013. Very Salute. good. Second. No, here, second? Second. Chris, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Um, the next group are um, those folks that have resigned over the summer months. I would ask uh, you to accept the following motion. Move that the Board of Education accept the resignations of Lisa Berliner, effective June 25th, 2013. Karan Carpenter and Kara Wadlinger, effective June 26th, 2013. Jessica Baker, effective July 15th, 2013. Tor Fisk. Effective July 19th, 2013. Dawn Anstett, effective July 24th, 2013. Catherine Pilo, Leanne Ryan, and Tyler Webb, effective July 26th, 2013. Anna Aguirre and Kathleen Goodrow, effective July 30th, 2013. Catherine Donovan and Ellen Montos, effective August 9th, 2013. Jeffrey Hall, effective August 16th, 2013. And Zachary Washburn, effective August 21st, 2013. Very good. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask yeah. a, a question? It's just, um, just are there any themes to these re resignations in terms of you know steps or you know I know we talked yeah. last year about you know kind of the structure step structure and that being right kind of a problem if you will or an issue. <clears throat> um, is are there any themes in, in these that you'd 
you know, one thing we do is we, we hold exit interviews with folks who does those um, personally. And I think if, if I could pin it on three, you know, themes, there's no one major theme. I think certainly there were uh, some folks in that middle level salary mm -hmm. schedule that left because of dollars. Yep. I think that um, several people, it was proximity uh, of where they lived and connections to uh, towns where they took the job. And several of these were kind of promotional mm -hmm. in terms of that next level up in, in, in people's own development and work. So I can't pin it on any one thing. Thank you. Yep. So this is um, in past history, this is. Last year, I believe we I had, went we back had, and we looked. This is about 15. About Last year, I think we had 11 or 12, so mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. And are there any are there any big kind of um, are there any spots in here that are going to be tough to replace? I, I will say I mean there's certainly some very valuable people here, so I don't want to slight anything from from that sense. But I feel great about um, the new hires and the new people we've brought into the organization. Um, one of particular you, you know I don't want to say angst, but thought when it happened was the director of guidance position is such a high profile. Uh, <coughs> position at Simsbury High School, and I think we were able to replace that with an incredibly talented veteran person. So I feel fortunate with that particular vacancy. Good. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any other questions? Aye. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. We're on to. Oh, appointments. Acceptance of gifts. All right. On Exhibit 5, Acceptance of Gifts to Squadron Line School. So Burke will work us through those next three items. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so in keeping with our board policy um, of uh, requiring approval for gifts in excess of 1500 we have two uh, gifts, each of $2,500, in support of our um, squadron line team that uh, participated in the Kids Lit World Finals in South Africa this past summer. So it took place uh, during our board, uh, since our last board meeting. And um, this money helps to, helped to uh, um, pay for the airfare for the four students and the two uh, teacher chaperones. There were also um, 65 other individuals and organizations that made donations totaling just under $19,500 so we're really thankful um, for all of those donors but the board is being asked to uh, uh, approve those two larger ones from one from Ensign Bickford Foundation and the other from Blue Engine Message and uh, Media um, Eric Smith so I'd ask the board to uh, consider approval of that this evening and to uh, give our thanks. Do you have a motion? So moved. Susan second? Second. Chris, any discussion? It's pretty great. Yeah. Just, yeah. Um, my neighbor went on this, and it was a phenomenal trip, and the kids loved it. They had a blast and got so much out of it, And as did their parents. They had great experiences while they were there, and, uh, and it was just a fantastic thing. So thanks to everybody who contributed. What a, what a great opportunity great, it was a we very gave the great kids. Honor. Great honor. Was this the second year that this This was the second, second year, year, and I believe Meg uh, Evans is here, the right. principal, but we had four students that, that attended, and I believe we came in fifth uh, in the competition. So not only did they have the opportunity to compete, but they also did a lot of fun uh, sightseeing activities as well. But, you know, I don't know, Meg, if you have a, anything I, else to add. I think some of the feedback was is that they were true ambassadors mm -hmm. of Simsbury and Squadron and our state, that the, their ability to interact with other students from the different countries. There were dinners where they would meet and converse with authors and other um, literary experts. And so th for them just to be able to engage in those levels of conversation and interact with others and just be a part of that group really made um, everyone very proud. So we're certainly excited about the academic component, but also the fact that they would be such mm -hmm. well representatives of, a, of our community. Um, and we couldn't have done that without the generous donations of the, t of the town. So we really do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. That's, so That's cool. great. Yeah. How did they get accepted? This is the second year in row. Last year they were in New Zealand, I it's, believe. It's the, a competition. The group. So they won it here. Okay. Um, there's a, the local competition for the U.S. is at, at Central. And so there were quite a few teams. I don't know the exact number, but Squadron had four teams that competed, and we had one that took the championship. And then whoever wins That's that great. round goes to the world finals, which is all over the country. 
next year's in Canada, so um, we're we'll hoping see. that it'll be <laughs> <laughs> a little easier. Yeah, that's great. Oh, that's Thanks. great. That's Thanks, great. Mike. That's great. How long were they there? Um, it varied, but they were there for a minimum of seven days, and then some families were able to extend it. But yeah. they were able to go to game refuges. What a great um, opportunity. Mm. The That's place great. that they were, Durban is um, known for its beating, so they were able to do some of the beating um, along with some local locals. So it was quite an experience for them. That's great. That's great. So when do you start preparing the students again for? Oh. Or when do they start preparing for the next? I think what makes us most proud is that we don't do a whole lot of real prep until after they win the competition. Right. That we're a very inclusive um, school in, in developing our teams. We just let the sixth graders know about it, and anyone who signs up who wants to be a part of it is a part of it. They were competing against some teams that are gifted and talented, and there are some teams that have been like in it for three years, and they've been training, and for us to have this level of success level of success with the inclusion model that we have is just it makes it even that much more special. That's great. That's great. Well, I'll even I'll even add. In, I think in June you had um, on stage the teachers, the staff versus the students in 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 that. So uh, Susan and I both attended. So so that, that was great. That was very very interesting. So uh, I applaud applaud the teachers. As Susan and I were sitting there, there were some tough the questions. The wealth of knowledge those kids had yeah. was. <laughs> I think it really shows another community effort that we couldn't do it. You know, it's, it's a accumulation of the involvement of parents and teachers and students all working together. That if you didn't have those three pieces all in together, they couldn't have the success that they do. So it's really a, a success of the community. Good. Thank you. Look forward to another team this year. Look Great. We're that. in Canada? Can't, we, um, I'm not quite sure. So. <laughs> well, we have a board of ed sure. member who uh, knows Canada very well, so he'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Home and you're gonna drive so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you. Just volunteered, so good. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, Erin. Very good. Um, do I hear a motion? Yeah. I have a motion. Second. Oh, where are we? Second. Just vote. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Great. Look forward to next year. All right, we are into exhibit six, gift to Sims Republic Schools, Henry James. Okay. The next two uh, items here are PTO gifts. This is uh, the latest from Henry James uh, PTO with some technology donations. Um, the total value is $4,740, and they are uh, looking to donate five iPads and eight Chromebooks that would be used in both uh, language arts as well as world language and reading intervention programs. And uh, social studies <coughs> would be the uh, uh, location for the Chromebooks. And uh, this brings PTO's uh, total donations up to $123,000 since uh, we started tracking that back in 2007, 2008. Those are PTO wow. donations wow. just for just remarkable. those yeah. types of uh, causes. And uh, we'd ask you uh, approve that donation as well. Very good. Uh, do you hear a motion? So moved. Susan, do you hear a second? second? Chair, any discussion? Thank you. Couldn't do it without them. Yeah, that's <laughs> wonderful. That's that's one. That's that's great. Very very well needed. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you, Henry James PTO, for that very generous donation. All right, we are on to Exhibit Seven: Gift to Pub Simsbury Public Schools Squadron Line PTO. One of your last meetings uh, in June, you may uh, <coughs> recall that there was a donation um, for this same purpose. That the board approved $16,000, and over the summer, um, we were happy to uh, receive word that there was an additional amount of money. And we have some representatives here this evening oh. from the uh, PTO, Christy. That's great. Hi, I'm Christy Pascavis. Pascavis. Hi, Christy. Hi, of course, Meg is, uh, is here. And we worked um, in terms of defining a larger scope of work. So now, with a new uh, additional donation that they were uh, proposing of $21,500 would bring the total project budget for a renovation of the playground at Squadron Line to $37,500. And we're very excited to, um, to get the, the plans finalized and actually have an install scheduled for this fall, pending your vote this evening. Right. So uh, I know there'll be more word coming out through Meg and, and uh, Christy looking for uh, volunteers for certain aspects of that <coughs> later on. But uh, for now, we'd just like to get this, the uh, uh, boards okay on this project budget. Great. Do I hear a motion? 
So moved. Michael, uh, second? second? Second. Any discussion? Yes. Wonderful. Great. Any comments? Thank um, you. Very yes, thank you very much. Well, like, I just wanted to thank the community for that. We're very excited. We thought phase one was just going to be able to renovate the sandbox area with some dinosaur bones in it. And then through the generosity of people, we were able to come up with this larger sum. And so we will be able to replace the playscape area. Uh, and put in some other um, equipment like a balance beam and some climbing things. So we're very excited about this opportunity. Um, the place <coughs> is in much need of, of replacement. So again, we couldn't do it without the support of the community. That's right, yeah, thank you. Um, we're really excited about it, cannot wait for it. So we're fingers crossed there are no big October storms this year. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. I am keeping my fingers crossed. We all will be. <laughs> Singing to the choir here. That's that's right. That's right. And I will volunteer the board of ed should you need volunteers to help that. So Happy that we to get help. this thing Absolutely. moving. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thank Thanks. you very very much. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you very much. All righty. We are now on to information and reports. Exhibit eight in your packet. The school year opening <coughs> reports 2013-2014. Okay. Thank you. So we have I think a lot of. Uh, <coughs> really positive information to share about our opening and uh, we're going to take different piece, pieces of the puzzle uh, and work through this from uh, kind of the personnel side of new hires, uh, talk a little bit about enrollment, talk about facilities and talk about the curriculum development work that was done over the summer. But uh, I just want to go back and say that uh, as superintendent I felt like our, our convocation um, and our kickoff to the school year was very positive. Uh, and really try to send the message and thank the staff for how we have uh, approached the change process. I mean, we have talked at this board level uh, over the past year a lot about the different facets of change uh, organizationally that we're faced with as a result of uh, many of the kind of concurrent reforms that are going on. And I think that uh, our teachers have, have faced that with uh, a high level of, uh, of class and uh, motivation, uh, and we'll continue to work through that uh, collaboratively together, and I think that'll be really important over the course of this year. And I really tried to uh, touch on a few what sound like simple themes, but I think organizationally are very important, and that is that every child deserves uh, a highly effective teacher. That's why we're here. Uh, that's our mission. Uh, and at that same time, every staff member and every teacher deserves uh, a really strong professional culture to work in. Uh, and if we focus on those two things and develop them together, I think we'll be extremely successful as we work our way through. So uh, we receive positive feedback on that. Uh, you know, when you, when you open up, uh, you don't think about all the, the different nuances of the organization, but you know, the transportation effort alone to coordinate that and uh, uh, the bus stops and everything to get uh, kids to and from school on those first, uh, first days are, uh, you know, can be anxious for people. And, and it was great to see that we uh, move things through relatively smoothly. So I am going to turn things over to Aaron for the <coughs> first part of this, and then um, I'll be back to talk a little bit about enrollment. Great. All right, so there's several parts to our opening report tonight, and I'm going to kick it off with the new hires, and certainly not going to take credit for all of this. Sue Lemke certainly spearheaded uh, the hiring process that began last spring, but in her absence, I'm going to show you and share with you the kinds of um, experienced people, new teachers and experienced teachers that we brought into the district. So uh, we're always looking for the top quality teachers. Uh, at Sinsbury High School, we hired 17 new staff members from a variety uh, of different um, backgrounds and areas uh, and all of them have stepped right into the the work and um, working it's like they were been here a long time so 17 new folks at uh, Simsbury High School at Henry James we uh, welcomed eight new staff members again from social studies to math to special education and music and uh, some of these uh, folks um, with experience and some brand new people to the profession as well at our elementary level, we welcome 10 new uh, staff members at uh, every one of our schools, either one or two folks um, that uh, are new at our elementary level. Again, we brought in people that are brand new to the profession and some um, with experience. So this uh, next slide really does show you um, the experience that 
teachers uh, came to us. Out of 33 new people that we hired, there's a variety of experience that they come with. 22 of the new people have zero to five years of experience. Uh, five of the folks that we hired, six to 10. And we hired eight people with 11 or more years of experience uh, this year as they uh, come to us. We also look at the academic preparation that teachers uh, come to Simsbury with, and as you can see, um, we have 27 or 27 out of the 33 teachers that come to us with a master's degree or beyond, um, with about uh, the rest of them, eight of them that are just brand new right out of school. Um, so it does round out and gives us a real variety of um, <coughs> experience when they come. When we welcome our new teachers, we bring them in about five days before the rest of the faculty come uh, for the first day of school. And we have designed those days to really give them an opportunity to hear about the Simsbury Public Schools, hear from different folks, not just Sue and myself or from uh, Matt Curtis, but from a variety of folks to get a sense of who we are, what we believe in, and what our mission is for the Simsbury Public Schools. So Matt kicks off um, the opportunity with our new teachers, uh, talking to them, uh, about our belief set and his vision for the work that we do uh, here in Simsbury. Uh, I do a fun kind of video with um, the new teachers, um, showing them the layout of the Simsbury, the actual footage of what we look like, the, the, the north, the south, the east, the west, and uh, giving them an opportunity to really interact with who the principals are and get a sense of who they are. Uh, we do a really nice piece for new teacher orientation where we bring back second year teachers and we brought back four folks this year, uh, T uh, Tamara Edney, Kelly Callahan, Steve Turgeon, and Melissa Lestaco, so somebody from elementary, middle, and high school. And they actually designed their own presentation and the fact that they're still standing and surviving and actually really enjoyed their first year in Simsbury. And so it's great to hear them give their experiences of, of what it means and you hope that out of these 33, we'll have some of them standing in front of new folks again uh, next year. Uh, we did a huge piece with the teacher evaluation, as I had mentioned earlier. Last spring, we spent about 12 hours with our current faculty and really prepped them on the new teacher evaluation plan. And so we actually used about three hours and brought them on board with what the uh, teacher evaluation plan here in Simsbury looks like. Interestingly enough, many people that came from other districts were very unfamiliar and had not even seen elements of the new teacher evaluation plan. So we were pleased that we had been a little bit ahead of the curve and were able to really get them in. And then other folks, when they got to their buildings, their departments, or their grade levels, able for others to help them um, as well. Johncia gave some uh, a nice overview on technology to get them set up. I talk about professional <coughs> learning communities. We engaged Cindy Freilinger and Terry Heinz to talk about the most important important part and we actually kicked the week off with that um, when just trying to get them to know what their benefits are, what when they're going to get paid, um, and then all the other personnel procedures that need to take place. So we it's found they listen much better when they know when they're going to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> we actually did so that on the first that from afternoon. The back <laughs> <laughs> so um, another aspect that we actually kicked the the um, week off with, and we've got four folks here that are going to give you a little bit of what they did with our and what they do over the course of the year with new teachers, first year teachers, or teachers in their second year and it's the team process it's um, the the induction process and what we have done here in Simsbury is that we have Jan Sands who is our lead and I'll have Jan Sands come to the table um, and her colleagues who we call master mentors and we actually have a few others that were not able to be here but Paige Colantonio, Sharon Cabell and Laurel Archambault are here as well and so they're going to walk you through um, a piece of the work that they do with new teachers and continue to do which is a state mandated uh, piece of um, for new teachers so I'm going to pass be it to you. Before you go on can I just going back to your first year at Simsbury um, that's that's really interesting that you have the, the four teachers that came in yes. their second yes. year. Yes. Were there any similarities or dissimilarities in, in the four teachers when they were talking about their first year as they concluded their year? You know, they, they all came with very different backgrounds. Uh, Tamara, you know, at the elementary, and Kelly at the elementary, Steve at the middle and the high school, and Melissa, you know, a, a high school math teacher. Um, it, it really they, they did it's it's about learning just what happens every day you know what's coming up for the next week or the next month but they really felt which I think is 
excellent feedback, and they may talk about it as well, is the culture of collaboration and the support that other people step up and give to new people, which is really helpful. But just getting through it your first year, now they feel like pros. When we bring them back, you know, these four people, they're standing up there like, you know, <laughs> they're feeling really good, where last year they were sort of sitting there not knowing what it was going to be. But these folks have their hands really right around these new people and I can't this is this model that we have here in Simsbury I want to take it on the road because these are spectacular people and they care about our new teachers and the work that they do is goes unmatched by any other district as far as I know we're actually the um, musical interlude for the night. <laughs> so right here, so to sing a little. Um, Tom, excuse me, Tom, you have a question. Just one question. Oh, I'm yes. I mean, a lot of a lot of moving parts, comings and goings. How many openings right now are there throughout the system? And in, in terms of, are, you all, are we all set? We're staffed out. We are. We're staffed out. Yep. We're all, yep. we got it all right up until. Yeah. We, well, well, we, as I said late. to Matt a little earlier, I yeah, mean, the hiring, yeah. some of the resignations were late in August, so right. the hiring took place right up until right. then, but we're fully staffed. I, and those are actually, you know, from a personnel standpoint, Tom, the, those can be tricky um, because you kind of have the right to hold an employee that resigns in August mm -hmm. for 30 days. Um, by contract, but you also recognize that in a classroom teacher situation, that's not best for kids to bring okay. uh, a teacher back for 20, 25 classroom days, establish right. an and environment, then and then transition in. So yeah. while it, it did create quite a bit of busyness in a, in a few small cases, I think mm -hmm. um, it's worth putting the time in on that spot to make sure by day one you have a good qualified mm -hmm. person in that, in that classroom. Thank you. I know you guys are all busy over the summer. Thank you for all your hard work. And Sue is not here tonight, but she certainly led the... Right. The, uh, the work on this so all right Jan so we are here, thank you very much for having us um, we are here to talk about team and and with the way we start with new teachers and we're going to pretend you're all new teachers too um, and so please say something because it's really bad when no one answers <laughs> so, um, we, we start off with this graphic which is from the State Department because this is a state um, run program mm -hmm. And it is a teacher induction program. So we always start off all of our new teacher orientations talking about what they think this graphic symbolizes because obviously it wasn't chosen just willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. So what do you all think that it might represent in terms of team, which is obviously teacher <coughs> education and mentoring program? Well, as a chair, can I just like one of my colleagues. No. It's your, your stage. <laughs> 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 there are no bad answers. Right. There's no wrong answers. <laughs> well, as chair, I get to go last, so. <laughs> Anybody? Oh, I thought you were going to pick. Oh, right. well. <laughs> okay, Chris, Chris, there we go. Chris. Before I ask when I get paid, I'll answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask whenever you want. It's still not the same. The same. <laughs> I actually see two things. I see two people working in conjunction, but I also see the synergy and choreography of two people dancing. Mm. Very nice. We, we, we're big on the dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Any others? Anybody else? Like the reach for support. I see that. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. To me, it looks like they're climbing over something together. Mm. Mm -hmm. nice. To me, it looks like collaboration and collegiality as they get to the top of the summit, which means that they've achieved where they want to be together. Thank you. Thank God no one said jumping off a bridge. <laughs> 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 Next year. <laughs> Sorry, I have to try to think of something that we need to say in response. Um, it's a mutual bungee jump. <laughs> <laughs> there are no strings. <laughs> um, this is really very important, the idea of working together. And um, this is where I think the, the, the faculties in Simsbury have done an outstanding job in mentoring the new teachers. This is a collaborative program that demands almost as many hours from the mentors as it does for the new teachers. And, and I would just like to publicly congratulate the dedicated people um, who spend a lot of time with new teachers here in Simsbury, mm -hmm. um, helping them to not only understand the team requirements, which we'll 
uh, briefly talk about, but just surviving each and every day, how to get to the end of the period, when the period ends, perhaps, um, for, for at the high school. So um, you should all be very proud of the work that these people do with very little financial compensation. Um, they just do it for the good of our profession and for um, our future colleagues and the future of the students in Simsbury. Um, as Matt said, this is all about um, quality teaching for the kids in our classrooms, and that's what this program is about. It's a two-year induction program um, for new teachers or those who have not been previously certified in Connecticut, so there could be veteran teachers in this program as well from other states. And the, the basics are mentorship and professional development, and it's about growing, <coughs> um, starting from wherever you are and growing over the course of the two years and establishing habits of mind that um, my friends will talk about um, for the rest of your careers, not just for two years. Um, and it's a series of five modules, and we're not going to bore you with a lot of um, this technical business, but it's, it's aligned to the Connecticut Common Core of teaching so that what all of us are expected to exhibit in our classrooms in terms of the skills that we should know and be able to do in to, of, in, for an effective teacher, for veterans, it's also expected of, of beginning teachers as well. And so we and the mentors guide um, these new teachers along this path, which we hope is right. one of filled with collaboration. Can I just go back for a minute? I just want to say on those five um, modules and our seven teaching standards that we've talked with you a lot about are absolutely aligned to these five modules. So we that's the, the <coughs> backdrop of this work and the backdrop of our teaching standards on how they were created are definitely aligned. So that's good news on this part. I'm yes. sorry. So it's a one-to-one -one every new teacher or has a mentor. a mentor. Yes, it's one of the wonderful ways that Simsbury is supportive. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the number of years they have coming into the system. So we saw that a lot. some of the teachers had 11, 11 years. No. Well, if they haven't been certified in Connecticut, yeah. yes. It's tied to certification. It, it's tied to certification. And that's what this, that's this next slide. Um, this is tied to Connecticut certification. So successful completion of this two-year program is required for um, teachers who have, who have an initial education certification to progress to provisional. Um, my lovely colleague Paige. Yes, <laughs> for the mission, you were, you were saying, what does it stand for? And it really is the collaboration and working and really developing that with our, with our mentees and also with the <coughs> staff to come in and making sure that they feel welcome. What does it look like? You've got this knowledge, let's go into it, and our mission is let's put it to practice, which next slide will, will show is we're gonna build on the knowledge and the skills that they have, and as a mentor, and as people that we get together to oversee the mentors, we work hand in hand professionally, which is the next slide, but just to tell you that we have meetings every fourth Tuesday. We're there for support, and they can come anytime. I'll go to different schools um, on the elementary level to help if they can't come to Central where we, we hold our meetings. And having a mentee last year for, and having them for two years, it was wonderful because you think, oh yeah, I really should reflect on this. And coming into the new evaluation when we was first rolled out last spring, month, oh, we have a team. I know what you're talking about because we've been doing this. Mm -hmm. So they will be prepared. It will be really nothing new. It will be new for veteran teachers just to take that time to, okay, let's put it into practice. What am I really going to work on? Collaboration, they're all set. So it's really great. So we can come together, help, and guide them along the way. Be a big sister or a big brother. <laughs> it really does help. As Erin mentioned, the module process reflects the common core um, of teaching standards and Simsbury's teaching standards. The five um, modules include classroom environment, planning, <coughs> instructing, and assessment. The fifth module, we've been able to be part of a pilot program for the past two years where we've been able to bring mentees and mentors together and identify certain um, professional responsibilities that we have. We've, um, the first year we did it, we separated the high school and the middle school and the elementary. This past March, we brought everybody together, which was really incredible to have the dialogue across um, grade levels. Um, we, the one area that we do need to cover is 
as um, deemed by the state is bullying. Um, and then there's other things such as social media, communication, things like that. When the mentor and the mentee first work together, they identify a need for their professional growth, and this reflects back to the um, specific modules. They identify an area that they want to work on and then plan out what they're going to do. When they make their plan, that's signed off by the um, building administrator, and that's signed off for a couple reasons. There's that, that accountability factor, and it should they need additional resources. Now, that's usually like a book, maybe a conference. We're pretty sure they're not going to get to go to Hawaii or any place like that, because we have tried that on occasion. Um, then the student, or the, the mentee works along with the mentor in figuring out what they need to do. They, um, this is all a web-based program, so the, men, the mentor records all the meetings. We're responsible for doing at least 10 meetings, 10 hours. Um, with the mentee prior to their submission of a paper, and the mentee will keep a log on the um, on the website. We encourage all mentees to not only do that but keep everything in Word, just because our first year with the website was kind of shaky. Um, we learned a lot, um, and then the whole process starts all over again. Um, in terms of Simsbury support. I just want to make one comment. That module process that Sharon um, talked Keeps about, going. that is the same process that veteran teachers are going to yeah. um, go through in the new teacher evaluation <coughs> program. So we'll all be on the same page. But I want to just echo Paige's um, comment that the new teachers are going to be ahead of the curve um, and the mentors, because the mentors mm -hmm. who understand um, <laughs> the looking at the standards and demonstrating mm -hmm. growth are going to be all set for the new teacher evaluation. And it's done, you know, four times by these new teachers. They do it for every single module, except for the professional growth, which is done a little differently. So they really are used to that process and that mm -hmm. system. Um, for Simsbury support, we offer a lot of supports. We've done this you know, now for a few years that we've established this ever since the best portfolio program, if you remember that. Mm -hmm. This is what has taken over. Um, we have established a team coordinating committee um, to develop a support plan for our school system. Um, we meet twice a year, usually twice a year. Um, and we have people from around the district that all are part of this, as well as a representation from the SEA. Um, so we are all on board with what is going through with this process with teachers, administration, and with the SEA as well um, to make to make sure we're all on board. <coughs> um, the team district facilitator, you know, Jan Sands, we also have the master mentors at each school, so everybody is stationed. Except for elementaries, you do have to share their report. We're trying to look for a few more elementary as well, um, just to make it a little simpler on the, the people down there. But we have um, Jan Sands and, and Rob Jeffers, who is at the high school, and we have <coughs> Paige and we have um, Sharon at the elementary levels, you're a squadron stationed there, and you're at Central. Central. And so they can kind of get to the other schools, or they all meet together. Um, and then Henry James is, is my school, so we help out with, with those folks. Um, <coughs> the mentor teams are matched according to content area and building as much as possible. And once in a great while, that's not possible if it's, if it's a music person. They happen to be the only person in that school. So they might be, you know, from, say, middle school to high school to be matched with a person. But as much as possible, at least content area, um, and as much as possible, building match as well. And that's not the case in many, many school districts. Right, right, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> planning meetings in September for mentees. There's a little release time. I think our date is going to be the 24th this year, where they're going to have a half-day session where they can really go over this process. What is the, you know, the cycle that they have to go through, um, and begin meeting with their, with their mentors. It is a mentor <coughs> the new teachers are getting together them that day, which is a great time to get them just, you know, really start to work together, look through the indicators, and go through that process. Um, <coughs> Laurel, the mentors go through specific training as well. It's not anybody just can't choose to be a mentor. They have to go through hours of training themselves in which to do it. So we've got a number. We've increased yes. the mm -hmm. number of people. We were a little short at one point, but increased the number of people that are certified or trained in which to work with new teachers. And if we didn't have these willing staff members, mm -hmm. we would not be able to uh, give all of the new teachers a discipline-specific building right. mentor. It really is asking a lot of the mentors, much different than it used to be with the best portfolio system. They do have to devote at least 10 hours per module, which is a lot when you're talking about all the different meetings that people are already doing. So and, it's a and wonderful. that's a minimum. That's a minimum, yeah. absolutely. I mean, there's something, as Jan well knows, there's something like a well, well about that. Um, <laughs> so monthly meetings, we hold fourth Tuesday monthly meetings. Um, great time to bring them in. We'll do you know, PowerPoints, have them work together with the mentors. Sometimes we do ones that are very tailored towards the mentors themselves to give a little extra training. 
training, you know, how to deal with, with different types of personalities. So it's a wonderful way to, to really just get you to understand the whole person. You know, you really are here to, to help them through this process and to be a support. You are not evaluating them, you are helping them through, you, just like that, walking over that mountain together. It's really us helping them, being the person they can go to as a mentor and as a master mentor at the school. That's really what we facilitate with them um, in any way we can possibly be there to help them. They're being evaluated by other people and that's, there's plenty of evaluations going on and set up for them so it's nice to have someone that's non-evaluative that they can go to and speak with. Um, <clears throat> There's informal visits by, you know, for Dan Sands where the facilitator will come in and, and speak with people or see them and see how they're doing the process. But also, also the master mentors at the schools will go and just, you know, jump in and say, oh, how are things going with you two? You know, give us a little insight. You know, where do you have questions? Um, and, and along with those four Tuesday meetings, which is really wonderful. Um, next slide, yeah. Is the mentor calendar that we've created, well, and Jan has kind of really established this from the beginning on, of things that you do month by month, you know, the first kind of introduction to even just the school. I mean, when you have a new person coming in, it's really, you know, you don't know where the copier is. You know, you want to know where the library is. Where can you do library? Where do you make your laminations if you have something to put in your room? Just little things like that. So establishing your school and what's available to you, you know, meeting people that might, they might not know. It's good <coughs> to meet the guidance counselor, the, the behavioral specialist if you happen to have it in your school, different, you know, people that you would need to talk to throughout the time that you're there when you have questions about things. Um, so going through that with that calendar. <coughs> and the next slide, we have release time equivalent of two full days per year per team. So they are able to get a little release time to go and observe each other. Um, it's nice for that, that mentee to come in and look at the mentor and see how they're teaching, how they're dealing with discipline. That is their first module they have to work with, um, you know, ways they manage their classroom, uh, which is really tough for that new teacher. It's something that's very, foreign to you besides your student teaching you know placement so that's that's a lot to take in that first year um, <clears throat> and then the, obviously the mentor going in here observing observing excuse me the, the new teacher as well and talking with them about what they should be kind of working on looking at you know how can they improve certain areas so it's a great way to have that again non evaluative way to kind of just talk about things you know, get things out there what, what's a different way we can approach something um, we've also established that we give the book, The Art and Science of Teaching, to all the new teachers in our system, which is wonderful. It's a great benefit that we have that's been provided by, by folks here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, just, one, yeah. just one more thing. Our administration is very, very supportive in trying to um, align the new teacher evaluation uh, system with the team process. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Aaron, Matt, Sue, um, and all the principals, because they might have double or triple the amount of work as a new teacher with this team program if the building principals and our central office administration did not say, let's look for ways that we can align these two so that um, the work is doable given their busy days also. Especially with the new evaluative system mm -hmm. coming in. It's, so, it's complex for just teachers that have been veterans. It's mm -hmm. so hard. So for a new teacher coming in, it's overwhelming. So <coughs> that is great that we have that alignment. Mm -hmm. So I think, as you can see, we have a tiered approach to this, uh, and Sue and I working closely with Jan, but likewise, the master mentors, the four or five of you that work directly, these are like the leaders of this work for our new teachers, and then the mentors that work directly with the new teachers. And these folks have put an enormous amount of time into really training and offering training to people in our district and uh, I it, it really I, I can't say enough about the fact about the support that we can give to our new teachers and the seriousness that all of you take um, when you working um, in this capacity so we thank you and appreciate you giving us the opportunity to hear about the work that you're doing um, so I, if there's any I just wanted to say thank you as well and I think that you know we understand how complex the work of teaching is and then coming into the profession at a time when I think it's more challenging than ever and I think what this does more than anything is open doors and it gives permission to people to ask questions too and <coughs> go to people um, that have a level of experience that they might not have yet and have those questions and we've talked a lot about uh, professional learning communities right. over time as our teacher teams and how our teacher teams function and set goals and collaborate but really this is an example I think systemically of that concept of a learning culture that's bigger than just teacher teams it's how we start to operationalize and I think the more we can build on these kind of structures but to your point Jan make them coherent with what we already have right. so we don't yeah. continue to, to fragment is really important so and it's also a win-win mentors at, for us it is a way to stay fresh and, and mm -hmm. rejuvenated Absolutely. and um, to avoid stagnation and 
to keep wanting to learn um, with the people around us. Great. Thank sure you. don't want to take any of our requests. We, we do. 70s, 80s. <laughs> <laughs> After <laughs> 80s. <laughs> No, thank, thank you. Uh, um, you know, one of the questions I have picks up on it takes a lot of time. What's the feedback you're getting from your participants as to having the time or the right, the balance within their day to be able to fulfill this, um, you know, relative to other demands? Do they, do they feel they have time or is there, is it like really a lot of stress to, to fulfill this commitment? What's the sense you're getting from people on that? I think, I, okay, I think the we're pretty creative in terms of having the time to meet. But unlike the BEST program, this makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. Because as a beginning teacher, you need to get your classroom in order. You need to figure out your transitions. So you're taking an area that you say, it's not really working the way I want. This is what I want to happen. And you're implementing it right then and there. So it's time well spent. It's not right. time that you're videotaping for four hours and cutting it and things like that. So it really makes a lot of sense and it makes, um, so that's one area that they're like, okay, that worked. Next year when I start, I know I'll be able to do that. So it, it's time well invested. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. that, it is, that's a good it point. is a lot of time. I will say, you'll hear te new teachers that are like, oh my gosh, I have so much to do. They do have a lot of meetings. They have a lot of demands. So I'll be very honest. They're they are feeling stressed. There's there's you know no two ways about it. But it is they do. It's funny because at the end, we're getting even to the middle after they get through that first module, and they're like, wow, that's really yeah. helpful. I use that all the time now. You know, these things they learn through the the behaviors and the management of their classroom. So it's it's amazing to see that progression. And I think they really appreciate it. And when they probably come back and speak to the new teachers, yeah. they're like, it's worth it. It is. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it mm -hmm. because it is right. a, it is a big process. It is kind of daunting when you're a new teacher. Is there one of those five areas that that participants seem to be least prepared for or get more value out of than others? In terms of the standards? Right. That, I, it varies I, on the It, it depends Matt, on the teacher. Please uh, give your opinion. <laughs> they, they seem to have a lot of trouble with planning. There's a lot of, uh, it's very difficult sometimes to say this is planning and this is instruction. Right. And um, we, we spend a lot of time on the planning piece talking about how that's everything you do before you enter the classroom um, and going through how to how to really analyze the process of planning for instruction. And that's the first that's two modules are the ones that are right. the foundation, the classroom environment and planning, and that's what they, right. or our other teachers do instruction and a choice. Our first year teachers <coughs> uh, are doing environment because you can't teach if you don't have mm -hmm. a classroom environment that's conducive to learning and or you're not planning in a way that you can implement the curriculum. Those are the areas for focus for the first year teachers. And then the second year teachers do the instructing and assessing. And just just two more questions quickly. <laughs> I assume you have some of the mentor-mentee relationships that just don't really click. Mm -hmm. and, and what percentage of are those, and how do you deal with those as you run into them? Um, I'm a language person, not a numbers person, <laughs> but it's very small. Mm -hmm. We have had mm -hmm. a, occasionally on an issue with her, because this really is a relationship, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it can't yeah. be just, it's not a sterile environment. So we have had, I'm going to say, I how many probably years? Probably the whole time we've I'm going to say it. two. Maybe two. I think yeah. you're right. In probably the past, the past five at least four years. or five years. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that the potential was considered percentage. was right. considered with the planning, right? There's a that process. Usually is. You really yeah. think about yeah. right. Yes, right. 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 This is what you should do. Right, right. And um, <clears throat> so we, we really try to prepare people for what's in store. Mm -hmm. okay, so you're obviously <coughs> picking the right people and training them right to have that small right. percentage. Of great mentors. We hope so. Yeah, our mentors yeah. are. There's fantastic. also, there's a process. It's, again, like um, Aaron said, it's not like someone says, ah, I think I'll be a mentor. They have to go approach their administrator. Right. Their administrator, I believe, signs it's off on it and recommends them to, to the process. to be a mentor right. in the first place, yeah. And just my last question, one thing I'm, that that's impressive to me is the effort to really integrate this with the core curriculum as well as the teacher evaluation. So our, with all the intensity of conversation around core curriculum, 
any insights as to what you're learning as professional teachers in terms of your own comfort, increasing discomfort with it, likes, dislikes, just you know, as something as the tidal wave that we're all going to be experiencing, just any insights from this experience? I would say just a plus for collaboration, just being able to to work it out, talk it out, to try it out. And that's just a, a, just a focus point to be able to do that or to help the new teacher try it. Right. It's, you know, we're, we've got a lot to learn, but when you step back, you know it. You can do it and you can support them that way. Let's try it this way. It's a great way. It's a great way to get it started, I think. Yeah. I'm excited about it, so. You know, one of the realities, and I'm kind of saying this more for the public, um, is you just can't drive towards increased performance without more collaboration, right. without more planning time, without more integration. When you want to have a core curriculum that's implemented equally, it just drives a lot more administrative time. And um, you know, um, and that's that, that's part of what you're saying. And it creates stresses for the staff because it's more to do. But it, you know, I just also point that out because a lot of times people look at the schools say and say, why are teachers out of the classroom so often? Mm -hmm. Well, if you want an excellent coach, that that coach needs to be spending time talking with you know their peers and planning. Well, that's huge, and I I will say time is the biggest factor. It really is the biggest issue that we hear from teachers all the time. That you know I, just, I barely have enough time to get that done. So right. it's important to have that professional time to be able to really meet with you know with all those folks. So there's a lot of different. Mm -hmm. And likewise, for this leadership team, they have other responsibilities to the state for taking on this role and that they have to read other papers that are submitted around the state. So these folks are doing stuff on their own beyond the school day. Uh, as the It's a web-based program. All teachers in the state of Connecticut are submitting their papers, and these folks are readers, of, and they don't know who they're getting. But, they're but that, that is also to help us help the people here. Oh, so. mm -hmm. That's great. What, I, uh, what do you do with the papers? The papers are submitted at the end of every module that they do. Say it's you know three to four pages that they have to kind of explain the process they went through, um, give us data of, of what was achieved through that process within the I guess about eight to ten weeks mm -hmm. that they're using, um, and they have to show evidence of that. So as as reviewers, we look at that and we decide if they've shown the evidence or not. Um, and in most cases, people really are very thorough, and they've really explained what they have done through that process, and you can see the growth. So, and that's what the process of reviewing those papers is about. And very yeah, different than the portfolio. They must, they must demonstrate how their new learning impacted positively student, right. student achievement or student right. performance. Exactly. But we have to go to training for that also. Yes, we do. Every year. <laughs> Every year. Right. But then what do you do? I guess what do you do with that? Do you report back to the state? Yeah, state they, reported. They go back to the. They so score them. So that's they the assessment them. component right. of each of these individual teachers after they complete a module has a reflection or a paper they submit. So this is it's an interesting shift that took place between the old way, where the state assessed it right. as mm -hmm. part of this new plan. The state has put that back on individual districts to figure out a way to do it. So it's almost a consortium mm -hmm. of right. teachers that have put themselves in the pool to assess mm -hmm. um, the development of these new teachers. But this is a voluntary program. The beginning teachers must. It's not voluntary. Yeah, voluntary in terms of the state. I mean, the district doesn't have to have yes. this. I recognize the value. It seems amazing. But, no. but no, the district about no, this, this is volunteer. This is a mandate. Yeah, 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 they can't get there. They can't get there. Then the mentors is Wait, they chose me. I think to give a little background, previous to that, and maybe you're and Matt, you can jump in. Previous, we had best portfolio for for assessing that. So how many years now have we not been using best portfolio? Since 2009. 2009, 10. So the state legislature and and department of education and education committee had had you know looked at and we've been using best for how many years many, many years forever many and ever I, can't, I, I, can't, I was going to say at least 20 years we've been using that program and then then mandated to each district in Connecticut to now go with it with the team evaluate. teachers will not get Just their certification if they don't pass the modules they have to right. pass the modules right. in order to become to move from a provisional to a professional mm -hmm. certificate 
So what we've had is flexibility in how we mm -hmm. create right. this right. as a right. team right. and approach this as a team. So there is a right. uniqueness to the way we're doing this. Got it. And I, yeah, again, right. I, for I'm licensure. Not, I right. recognize the value of it. I, yeah. I'm mm -hmm. just curious yeah. as to. But right. your yeah. mentors. We are mentors as well. All the mentors are volunteers. Are volunteers. Well, there no, there is yeah. a, a stipend. There is a stipend, stipend. Mm -hmm. okay. that is stipulated. The state, you know, gives us a, a sort of a range of how we have to do this. But their positions as master mentors is an application process, and we interview, we talk, and we have five positions that we fill for that. And um, they don't have duties at their buildings and things like that we because duties. we have duties. Yeah, we have duties. I do. <laughs> many, many <laughs> duties. <laughs> yeah. Please don't take the duties away. Please. <laughs> I'm the official greeter at Squadron. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> On, on, on what you said, because you know, I remember when when the best program was being you know um, decommissioned, so to speak, or or evaluated. Sunsetted. Yeah. Sunset, sunsetted, <laughs> and the new the new team um, uh, uh, program was was coming into place, and and you know, it was it was a hard act to sell because the best portfolio had been around for what, almost 20 years, and mm -hmm. and this new this new program was coming in. But what is also interesting, which I also hear, and you had mentioned before, Jan, was that not a lot of districts, and I think Erin also reiterated, do the approach that we do right. here. We are right. exceptional the yeah. way that we have oh. from day one started the, the mentor mentee program and the support <coughs> with 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 veteran teachers uh, aligned with new teachers. Not a lot of districts have that luxury um, to, to be able to do that or the support or the financial to be able to, to push that. So that is something that is known around the state that we support. We have done that I think from day well, one. Well we worked hard. You know with any main mandate you take what you Absolutely. think is going to benefit you as the district and we put smart people at the table mm -hmm. and figure out how it will be aligned and um, coherent to the work that we do. So you make the best out of the mandates and right. we think right. this we've done it in a way that makes it work. Absolutely. So. Just my last question. When you have teachers from out of state I'm just curious what are their um, thought because each state is different you know when they from however they want to call their previous best portfolio or their team how do you see their um, evaluation pieces or how do they the out-of-state professional this piece of, of participating in team mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We'll actually get over the initial shock that they mm. have to do this. Well, right, <laughs> that, that's <laughs> understandable. That could be shocking for some people. Yes. You know, if they've taught for 10, 15 years somewhere else and then right. they have mm -hmm. to do this. Uh, but I, I, I'm a firm believer and cheerleader for this program. And once we get going, once they meet the people that they're, they're, are going to be their mentors and they see the practical daily relevance of this program, we sell it, and so do the mentors here. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe, I know I'm Pollyanna, but I believe that everyone ends up buying in because they really do see that this has a positive impact on the kids in the classroom and the collaboration and collegiality that it builds among um, the staff. And if that doesn't work, we have two celebrations a year yeah. at Abigail's, <laughs> one in January and one in May, supported yeah. by the SEA. So that's kind of well, you know. <laughs> no, The reason why I, I ask this, and in, in, um, just, just to bring that on, is because I do hear from other states. You know, I, I do hear from other state associations, in, in, in my position, mm -hmm. President is Cabe, and, and, but I do hear from other states how, when they look at that, because we're watched very carefully, you know, we've gone from a best to this, and now with our new ed reform. So many states, you know, see this. And it is, it is very different. It's apples and oranges in 50 states. There isn't one right. set form of, of the evaluation as we move forward <coughs> with that. So it's interesting to, to, to hear um, the remarks on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. So as we just continue into the school opening report, I'll talk quickly about those teachers now that are in the next phase of attaining tenure. They've been in our district either for four years because they came to Simsbury and had not been tenured in any other district or after two years um, of being tenured someplace else in the state of Connecticut. And we wel welcomed 11 teachers at convocation. We publicly bring them to the front of the auditorium and uh, give them a little gift. So it's really a fun celebration um, that we do at convocation as well. 
So those are Sue's slides. So this is my slide. (laughs) 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 So let me tell you a little bit about the work that we did over the summertime in regard to teaching and learning. Mm. Um, After we hired all of these folks, um, we continued with our summer academies, our literacy and our mathematics academies this summer um, that were well attended. We had 19 teachers and over the last couple of years, we brought on students from Simsbury High School to be volunteers people that students that might be interested in becoming teachers or exploring whether they enjoy that kind of work um, participate in our academies um, that are held at the elementary level Uh, this year we actually had a new uh, program which is a math enrichment program that really focused on problem-solving skills which was also well attended and um, a great addition to our summer offerings We um, engage, uh, teachers engage in a number of uh, professional development opportunities over the course of the summertime. Some of them are collaborative kinds of opportunities in regard to curriculum design, development, aligning the Common Core State Standards to our current curriculum. Um, Did some of that work, focused on teaching, uh, instructional strategies in the classroom that help implement the Common Core. Uh, But we had a number of elementary teachers that participated in that. And what we've done with those last professional, those last days in June, professional development days, is really Betsy's created a nice opportunity for teachers to get their materials and their units of study that they can preview and review over the summertime so that we don't have to spend the August time um, and hand it to them and then have to have them teach it the next week or two. So that's proven to be a a very well um, received um, opportunity. At the secondary level, we've continued our curriculum work um, and spent an enormous amount of time this summer. We had um, over 82 teachers working on curriculum um, in a variety of different areas, English, (coughs) math, science, social studies, music, um, and um, really uh, have done some good work around um, the redesign of our uh, curriculum frameworks. In addition, there's a number of teachers that go out for their own professional growth and development. There's some that we sponsors and there are others that go out on their own um, to explore. Again, we've had some teachers that went out for uh, advanced placement training, project lead the way training. Remembering that project lead the way, you cannot teach the course unless you've been trained in it, so that is certainly one that we support. Uh, Lori Martinson, one of our new instructional coaches, went to a math leadership academy at Mount Holyoke College, and it was very intense and came back with lots of great information that she's been sharing with our instructional coaches, Um, so she spent a week there. I also got some information from Barbara Barker, who is a science teacher at Simsbury High School, and on her own, she was called, she participated as a citizen scientist in an investigation of the effects of residential composting on scavenger ecology and she did that through Trinity College so that was her own professional growth and development but they sent us information on that and I commend her for doing that work and it's really just broadens her experience as well Uh, and the Simsbury Arts Academy had again a great um, you know summer we had 35 students in grades 1 through 3 we had 110 students in grades 4 through uh, 12 through looking at visual arts strings uh, jazz musical theater and had the culminating um, Susical the musical um, event that that occurred Um, and we have not only our Simsbury educators that participate but professors from Hart from Central Connecticut State University University, Hartford Symphony, so and Cindy all the fine arts too. and all the fine arts, and Sims, uh, Cindy Ram is just masterful at um, directing that program. So, again, it was really a very busy summer, and we've accomplished a great deal. And people have grown and developed, and um, really have enjoyed the opportunity to work with their colleagues and with students over the summertime. Good, very good. All right. Good slide. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I actually packed into one slide. Um, just a brief update on enrollment. Um, as you know, we provide a larger enrollment update on October 1st, which is the enrollment date that we officially report to the state of Connecticut. But we always take a look at our uh, opening day enrollment, which uh, 
on August 28th was 4,364 students. Um, pretty close to our projections, we're about 25 students off. Uh, and I know that we had several uh, new enrollees, like day two of school, there were 10 yeah. and 11 people uh, up here enrolling their, their children. So uh, it does mark a decrease of 121 students uh, from last year, which is consistent, as I said, with what the, what the projections were. Uh, overall, as that breaks down, we had a, a reduction of 83 students at the elementary level. And I think, as you'll recall, we reduced three sections. Uh, three FTE um, at the elementary school last year so we were right on target with what I think we talked about in the budget process is kind of strategic and responsible reductions of staffing levels as our enrollment uh, continues to go down so we'll have to do that again this year and really pay special attention to that um, a kindergarten cohort of 233 students which was actually about 21 more almost a full classroom more than what we had projected in kindergarten so we're gonna have to continue to take a look at that I don't know if that's still the effect of the full day um, but this year was projected to be a, a much lower uh, number overall compared to other cohorts and then it's going to start to pick back up uh, in kindergarten so an interesting piece to, to look at uh, Henry James was a uh, Roman of 732 which was down about 15 students the high school was uh, 1,534, which was down 23 students. So the decline there, not as significant yet, but in the next couple years when these fourth, fifth, mm -hmm. and sixth grade cohorts move on, we'll start to see a larger dip at Henry James and then subsequently at the high school. Um, open choice enrollment, we always report that out on first day to the board. We have 139 open choice students, which is about 3% of our population. We had 137 last year, so staying consistent uh, with that number. Um, in terms of class size, our class sizes uh, really look very good, uh, at least the analysis I've done at the elementary level. We report back on this on 10-1 as well. We had one classroom in the entire elementary level that was over the guidelines to start the school year. Uh, it was a, a single class at Squadron Line that had 23 students with the, um, the guideline being uh, 22. So uh, I can remember three, four years ago, we would start the year 11, 10 regularly uh, sections over the guidelines. So I think we've done a nice job in kind of uh, mitigating that and managing that. And I know that's been important to the board, uh, important certainly to our parent community and our teachers as well. So um, we will come back again and, and do a much more detailed breakdown of this. Looking forward, um, and locking in the number on October 1st. So I can answer any questions mm -hmm. that people have about I think some of us can remember looking, scrutinizing the overclass guidelines too and how many we went class by class. Mm -hmm. so, so it really has, uh, has improved. Yeah. Right, it worked that way. All righty. So Mr. LeClaire is going to do the piece on school security. All right. Yeah. I'm standing in for. Uh, Lemke, we each have uh, portions of this area, and um, we're really outing her. Those are big shoes. Those are high shoes. Those are shoes. Those are high shoes. Her role as uh, liaison with the police department. She has. Uh, she was involved, and in, uh, we're happy to welcome as a new school resource officer Todd Cushman, um, who was. Uh, also assigned not only to Henry James, but he's going to be uh, floating uh, at the um, K-6 schools throughout the district. And he joins our current school resource officer, Brad Chase, at uh, Simsbury High School. So we've gotten off to an excellent start there. And we're, we're really pleased with the uh, support from some But just to add one piece on that, my, f my first day of school, we all, as, as a central office team, would go and visit each and every school. Each time we got there, Todd was like so one step ahead. One step he was at you. every every school, so it was nice to see him on day one. You know, yeah. integrating with all the yeah. all the kids. It's really an exciting opportunity. And he's been a police officer in town for a while, yeah. so mm -hmm. he already knows a lot of real the nice right. community. Um, now, our, our largest um, physical project regarding school security, <coughs> as I recall, was the um, classroom door lock project, and that was for. Um, five of our seven schools, Latimer and Simsbury High School, already had the newer style of classroom locks, which to review is, is a lock that uh, you don't have to uh, exit the classroom to lock. You don't have to go out into the hallway to, to lock. And uh, we've had very good success with those. So more than 318 classroom doors, uh, hardware both uh, outside and inside, um, was uh, replaced through this project. We had gone out to bid in the spring. Um, and as you may recall, we had estimated that it would be $171,000 to do those five schools. And in part because um, 
a favorable bid pricing, but the other part of it was we <coughs> ended up um, being able to use our own in-house maintenance staff, several of our staff, to do the install at two of the schools. So that uh, saved us uh, more than $10,000, um, and we were able to get that work done um, over this this summer. So Steve Steve uh, Twitchell, Supervisor of Buildings and Grounds, was really the um, lead to get all of these details done, working with the uh, uh, contractor. So I'm really thankful that that, uh, that went smoothly. Uh, the next area is more of the um, follow-up to our consultant's security audit. ERCM was the firm that uh, you recall receiving a um, report on last spring, and they'll be following up with some visits this fall, um, and they'll be doing some drills with our schools, and we're going to be utilizing the standard response protocol to try to make a more consistent and simple um, approach to um, dealing with situations in our buildings. Um, another area that I'm working on is uh, developing cost estimates for the protective window film concept that is something that uh, helps to, you know, uh, make it very, very difficult to, to break a glass door or, or full-size window that you could gain entry into a uh, building with. And um, one of our neighboring districts has done some, um, some bid pricing and we're finishing up, uh, just actually received final uh, measurements on some added doors and we're going to be getting ready to uh, seek funding uh, on that and to go out to bid. And then lastly, we'll just be following up in each building with um, recommendations and modifications. Steve Twitchell and I met with, with each principal this, this summer to, to follow up on the uh, consultant's uh, recommended list. So that's a quick snapshot of, of what we're, uh, we've been doing and what we're planning to do this fall. Do you, have you seen other towns utilize the, um, the film process? Are they it, it's been it's been utilized. I don't think there's been uh, you know, huge numbers yet. Right. There's there was definitely a um, uh, recommendation of our uh, consultant, and, and we saw some some good firsthand footage that really made it uh, seem like a worthwhile investment uh, to to deter somebody from shooting their way in, uh, breaking their way in with a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. Even it, it is that amazing. Yeah, we it saw does that. Not oh, show right. visible. It's not a, you know it's not going to change the appearance. Of the Mm -hmm. Good. All right, so um, the opening of school report on this PowerPoint, I'm going to try to just weave a few of the other things in here in the interest of, of, of time. This is my favorite part, though, when you have pictures. Yeah, like pictures. <laughs> right into it. So we just mentioned the uh, lock upgrade project. That's a picture of, of the particular lock mechanism and you those are the lock. Do you want our well, be the photographer as well? <laughs> I can't take credit for most of them, only a few of them. Okay. Uh, Steve, Steve Twitchell was great to uh, provide a lot. Um, since we're a high school door replacement and refurbishing project, this one, there, was over, there were 60 doors that our um, custodial staff at Simsbury High School, as you can see, they utilized the shop, they, they sanded all those doors down, and Strip them, finish them, and put two coats of finish. And, and you see the doors on the right. Um, it, it really came out great. So that's something that, that kept uh, uh, folks busy this, this summer. Next slide, please. Um, at Henry James School, we had some new flooring uh, installed. This was in a, a particular part of the, of the building where we had moisture problems over many, many years, moisture seeping up. So we've got a, a, a special flooring in these four classrooms that should really prevent that from happening again. <coughs> also at Henry James School, um, we were able to do a, uh, an air conditioning uh, unit. You see it being installed here with the, with the crane above the computer lab. There's a lot of extra heat generated from the um, PCs there, and this has been something we've been hoping to do. Um, we were we uh, able to recycle here because a little bit later we're going to talk about the modular removals from Tooten Hills. Um, modulars, those were rooftop units that we were able to move over there and uh, utilize. Uh, this is uh, not just at uh, Henry James, just happened to choose this one, but um, our in house um, plumbing uh, staff was able to do many, many upgrades of uh, bathrooms in, in virtually every, every uh, building throughout uh, our district. It's the first thing my sixth grader mentioned. 
Good. The new mm. bathroom. She was very impressed. Good. Good. Very well needed. Very well needed. Yeah, very Both happy. fixtures as well as the partitions in, in many cases. Central School, as you mentioned earlier, we had started with a portion of, of lockers and now we were able to finish the, uh, these new um, uh, updated lockers for, for Central School. I just want to make sure that all lockers don't have to become 100 before. <laughs> 100 years I old. Think some <laughs> Let's see. Well, I we think some of the bathroom fixtures were just about Close. that. No, they really make a difference, though. They really, yeah, really bring so easy. Right. Nothing's in the halls. And we will be definitely doing that in other schools, and, and yep. we have some some quotes for some, and, and uh, some more. Added at Squadron as well, right outside the kindergarten classroom. We did a small bank of lockers at right. Squadron, and um, that was actually related to the movement of of the. Um, uh, Tootin modular programs over to uh, over to Squadron, which then had sort of a ripple uh, impact. So we needed some uh, certain sizes for our kindergartners. Latimer Lane School showing you one of our um, follow-ups from year one of the facilities and enrollment task force. The recommendation was to remove this white trailer, uh, 756 square feet at uh, Latimer Lane. This was actually exposed before it was moved, and you see now. Uh, that has been uh, removed and the site uh, restored. At Squadron Line, um, as well as Henry James, we're doing an LED exterior light project with some reimbursement from the uh, one of these two utilities. Also at Squadron Line, we improved uh, a couple areas of our exterior traffic flow. Uh, there's gates at both ends of the um, entrance road that goes past our playground. And the drop-off area when you come in, we've tried to follow what we did at uh, Henry James and create two uh, clear lanes. One is for dropping off and, and one is the that was ready to start school. Now Terraville School, we we did 90, 90, 95 percent of that renovation project a number of years ago. The last piece of that was able to be finished this summer and that was involving the uh, asbestos remediation of the old um, tiles and the old uh, flooring those those were able to be uh, done over the summer and then a new um, synthetic surface put down it's a multi-purpose room um, for that school and it's really come out uh, looks great, great. Yeah. That, that really, puts, wow. that really wow. finally finishes that at uh, Tootin Hills, besides uh, modular removal, we did um, improvements to flooring. This is off of the nurses and the uh, principals and the main office going into uh, kindergarten rooms. <coughs> and as mentioned before, the Tootin Hills uh, project was a very large one. We had um, approximately 8,700 square feet, I think, of uh, multiple buildings. I just chose that first one to show you that the uh, utility meters were back there. So those are gone. That was one of the primary uh, financial benefits here because they had separate service. Um, some pictures of some of the uh, process of it being uh, removed. And now the area uh, that uh, remains, the next slide is the last one. Uh, it was quite an expansive area, as you can see. Yes. Now, instead of the, the buildings kind of going right up against the fence and the tree line in the in the, <coughs> in the back, there's a nice open uh, area there. Brooke, and I would just add here that as we look at our 10-1 enrollment, we also had made the agreement to come back to the facilities and enrollment uh, task force with an update where we are and a relook at that phase two of modular removal to see the potential and the feasibility of that. So it's kind of an annual check relative to that initial project. So um, again, just uh, with, the, with the particularly short summer um, program moves that really started from two hills, a lot of staff involved with planning of, of, of uh, preschool that had to move to Squadron. Uh, Meg, who, who uh, had to deal with how to relocate multiple programs, including preschool ready to go, and then re um, distributing within her, her building, moving um, uh, kindergarten, things went very, very well. Steve Twitchell, it's district-wide maintenance staff, and all of our senior custodians did a fantastic job getting us ready. Good. Thank you, sir. Good. Thanks Thank so much. You. That's an awful lot of work. Yeah. Appreciate it. Really looks great. What so. a, in a short summer, you're right. Tremendous uh, improvement. A lot of, yeah. Wonderful. Good. All righty.
We are now on to, where are we? Yep. We are. We're on to uh, CMT and CAP Kept. review. So um, Aaron, Betsy, and Helen are here. And, and we're going to do this, uh, I guess, a little bit differently than we have in the past. Um, and it's a little earlier. We received our um, data from the state of Connecticut about a month, a month, almost a month and a half later than we normally do in terms of our results. And we certainly use those results uh, for quite a bit of the planning that moves forward. So a lot of that work is going on now at building level, and Aaron will talk about that. But we felt it uh, appropriate to come and kind of just talk through the data globally, not as comprehensive um, as, as the prior reports, with the recognition that um, this is probably the last uh, CMT and CAP report we'll have in front of the board because those two assessments are going away and we're, um, Aaron will touch on this in a minute, we're going to probably participate in a, a pilot this year and then we're on to Smarter Balanced uh, next year. But I think it will give an opportunity uh, for you to ask any questions you have relative to those two data platforms uh, and we'll be coming back later in the year with uh, building principals in the fall to talk about how they're kind of goal setting and doing their work at the building level. So a little bit different approach, uh, but we wanted to get the data out there. Mm -hmm. So this is a highlight that we're um, presenting to you tonight on the CAP, the Connecticut Academic Performance Test for 10th graders, the Connecticut Mastery Test, and special populations. And as Matt said, given that we received the data mid-August, um, teachers and administrators are digging deep into it. And it is one data point. It is our, our data point of standardized measurement. But we also have district measurements that teachers are using. And all of this in information um, and the data that they're looking at is what's informing their um, professional growth and development plans that they're putting forward for the teacher evaluation plan. So they're very deep into it. Uh, Matt and I are actually going out talking with principals over the next couple of weeks to get their perspective on their data points, including whether it's the CMT or the CAPT, as well as district assessments. So uh, what our um, ob objective tonight is to really give you a highlight overview of Simsbury student performance on uh, these standardized measures. And as Matt said, we presume this will be the last kind of presentation of this manner regarding the CMT and CAPT. Um, so um, we'll start off with the, uh, the CAPT and just so that uh, to refresh you that the CAPT tests in four areas. It's 10th graders, uh, mathematics, science, reading across the disciplines, and writing across the disciplines. And uh, what uh, this graph <coughs> shows you, and this is one that we thought when uh, the commissioner, when the, the, the results were distributed to the districts, the commissioner held a conference call to help explain some of the high points that he saw <coughs> as, a, uh, as a state level and saw what he said for CAPT, a pretty steady performance with some low areas and some high areas as well. But this is uh, Simsbury's performance as it relates to the state performance in this particular visual. Um, we look at the results here and we're looking, we're very pleased with our steady performance on reading, writing, and math, and science is an area that we will continue to talk about, and you'll see that as we go through this data today. There's some uh, disappointing results, but steady results in science, but also some interesting results in regard when we talk about some advanced uh, level of performance for our students in science. So as we look at um, our results, we continue to remain in the top 10% in the state uh, for our results for 10th graders. We have ranked either fourth or better in our district reference group in reading, writing, and math, um, not in science. Um, over the years, we have um, you know, had a very consistent uh, level of performance from our 10th graders, um, which indicates that we have a very strong curriculum that's guaranteed and accessible um, for all students. So when we ask ourselves how do we get these results, we, um, thank you. Uh, one of the things, and I think you've heard us talk about it tonight, not only through the opening report, but with our team, uh, master mentors and uh, facilitators, <coughs> that um, our teachers are engaged in collaborative conversations about the work that they're doing. They do this through professional learning communities, and we do this at the high school level through content uh, areas, whether you teach English 9 or US history. Teachers get together, and they talk about student performance, and they talk about instructional strategies uh, that they're working on. We work hard. I work closely with Neil and the high school administration to design professional development that's just in time and embedded um, work that 
uh, professional training that will assist them in their implementation of the curriculum. Um, we also are very fortunate to have the financial resources that the board supports and one of um, the greatest investments that we believe we've made at the high school level is putting in some of these labs. We have labs in math and English and science and social studies and they're staffed by the content area teachers. So when students have a need for extra support, they can get it through these labs. So we think that's also helping um, with our consistent results. Um, and obviously our teachers at the high school level, we have very, very smart teachers that know their content. Um, and that certainly is a benefit um, in, in our classrooms. So as you look at our um, results over time, um, we have a very consistent performance in math. We have a very similar consistent performance in reading and the same in writing. Our science, although consistent, we just can't seem to get out of that 70% um, area. And it's a, something that we want to continue to explore. We want to dig deeper into it. And we want to look at our district assessments and see what, that's, what kinds of information that's giving us as well. When uh, one of the goals that we have talked with you a lot about is we want to measure progress by the number of students that meet that advanced band. There's five levels, advanced being the highest goal, proficient, basic, and below basic. And so we're always working, working to get our students 50% or more. We've done that in science and writing. So let me just talk a little bit about science. This is what's so um, interesting when you dig deeper into the data, is that we have 53% of our students in science achieving in the advanced band, yet we still the total amount is at 70. So it really causes you to ask questions. Why is that happening? We have the m more students, we only have 20% at goal, and 20% of our students are sitting in that proficient band. Those are kids in science that maybe with a little bit more could have met goal. And so that's a large number of students in our, in our proficient band. When you look at our proficient or above, and some communities will report, all of our if we took all of our um, totals, we have either 95, 97, or 98 per percent of our kids proficient or better. Mm -hmm. But we continue to report to you that goal or better. So our students are learning. We have a very small number of students in that basic or below basic. But this science data is one that's a bit perplexing to us, and we want to dig deeper into it. Uh, this particular visual, I thought, is another one, and what we're looking at are some very similar trends, whether it's our performance in Simsbury, whether it's the performance by the state, or the performance that is at the district reference group, DERG B. And look at those, the pattern of that. It's a very similar pattern. So we're trying to make sense of that as well on how we perform. Um, strong performance in reading above, obviously, our DERG. Um, counterparts as well. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, a few years ago we began reporting this out one of another marker of success and something that's really important to us when we look at our students who take the cap test in 10th grade is how many of our students are meeting goal or better on all four on math science reading and writing and this year we're number two in the DERG we have almost 62 percent of our students that have um, met uh, goal or better on all four of the assessments one of the things that we're always looking at, I mentioned earlier, we're within the top 10% of um, performance at the state level, but um, we also want to look at like communities and how we perform against them. So when you look at reading, we do very well. We're um, second in uh, reading. We are um, fourth in writing. And when you look at the next slide and you look at math, we are fourth in math and we are this is a piece that is of concern to us, 11th in um, science. So that trend <coughs> of trying to get a little deeper into the data and trying to figure out what our core sequence is, what are our um, learning outcomes that we're asking kids to engage in over time, um, we'll be spending time, uh, the high school administration, Neil Sullivan and myself, working um, with Greg Core at the science, uh, in the science department to try to figure that out a little bit further as well. 
Likewise, the capped science is not going away. The capped science, although the rest of the capped will not be in place, the capped science will be in place until, they're telling us, until about 2018. So we have to pay attention to this and try to figure out what this means. So that's the big picture of um, the capped performance for 10th graders at Simsbury High School. Um, they are now our current 11th graders. And um, so we're high school teachers are um, really looking at data, um, trying to figure out who are those kids, what do we need to do to help support them. And likewise, what are the kinds of things that we need to continue to do to enhance the learning for those kids that are already meeting goal or beyond as well. You will hear more. This is one aspect. As I said, there's multiple data uh, points that we look at over time. Neil Sullivan always does his high school report. He'll do that later in October. Um, and this will be one piece of it. These slides may return just to give you a comprehensive picture of student performance at Simsbury High School. But he will be back um, to, to share that with you. So the second portion of um, this presentation is around the CMT. CMT is for grades three through eight. And I've asked um, Betsy to um, support us through this. And, um, Aaron, but I want to see if you have any Aaron, questions. Can I just ask you, like, yeah. The one slide that kind of caught my attention is, is this one right there, that one. Mm -hmm. the one more forward. Um, it's, it's the one that talks about all content areas. Oh. And yes. it's. Um, yeah. I don't know, it's 60, 60 right this there. one here, yep. right there. 60, yeah, 61 percent, and I know, I know that stacks up as very good relative to the other towns and whatnot, but, you know, at, at goal on all content, that's 61 percent, you know, I know it's one measure of how kids are learning and how, how, we're, how, how effective we are mm -hmm. as, a, as a community in terms of delivering what they need, but I don't know, it just didn't, um, didn't feel all that good that only 62 percent of the kids are at are at goal or uh, I think in all four areas, I mean, yeah. you know well, what, I mean? what it Just is is that that means they've passed they probably passed three of the four I, I'm with I'm with you and I'm, that's where the science piece is a little bit bothersome is where we have the 20 percent in the proficient band yeah is certainly adding to that as well because kids potentially could have passed three and not the science yep. I guess I mean one other thing I add I think it's you know, I agree the number in and of itself, and it's a data point. I think like any of these other data points that we've learned this year, you really do need to benchmark yourself to look at trends, both state and other districts. And this particular measure actually is the one we do right, pretty good, right? Yeah, pretty well, awesome. better than, I mean, comparatively yes, better are. than any of the others. So you, you try to wage through the relativity of it all as well um, in, in what it really means, but I understand the question. Mm -hmm. What struck me on this one is you look at the top six or seven, 2012, just about everybody dipped down. Mm -hmm. But then 2013, the, that same top six rebounded yeah. to higher than 11. We came up, but not yeah. quite as much. Those are the kinds of things, and when you look at, it was this particular slide here, it's, it's the patterns that are so similar. There's other questions when you look at the data. There's yeah. the numbers, but you have to dig deeper into who are the students, what are the, what's the content that you're teaching, what are the strategies that you're using, who are the teachers that are teaching it. There's so many questions that numbers present to us as educators, and we've got to try to wade through all of that. Yeah. And that's why we try to use this information as well as our um, end of course assessments or other common assessments that we use in the district because some of those are even better predictors to how students are performing. Because I'll tell you, when we <coughs> dissect this information and we pull out those kids that fall in that pro proficient band, yeah. or and it's like there's right. a story behind every kid. Mm -hmm. And um, so trying to figure out what it was or what it is to help them move to get to that next level. Um, With our number of elementary students, the physical number of students going down changes the statistics as well because you have fewer comparisons. So it could be just one kid as last year, it might have been four kids. Right. Mm -hmm. so it does I mean, make a difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean right. these, right. these numbers do. You even one at the high school. To that point, level, you yeah, take that school to school and comparing the data of, right. say, a terrafil right. school right. to right. a squadron line school. Right. If, Three kids or four kids out of a smaller cohort at Terra oh, right. moves mm -hmm. the yeah. It can move the needle. So that's why it's important it to really yeah. Yeah. talk Do about individual So it's good, to, but we have to keep yeah. it in perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you ever kind of do a recon with the kids who took the test to see 
how they felt about it, how prepared they felt, or you know, is that something that happens? You know, I, they take it. Not t- they never <laughs> want to speak of it again. We know the truth. <laughs> well, I'm, there, I'm, there I'm, is I'm informal. Totally. It's an, yes, there is informal. There's lots of adults that are working with the students and monitoring and overseeing the assessment. And there are conversations that take place like that was really hard, or I had no idea, or it was really easy. I don't know, Jacob. How I mean, it was two years or yeah, a year I, ago I when you took it. I felt pretty well prepared, you know, from all yeah. the tests. Yeah. yeah. I just, the conversation in my house, because my daughter is one of those kept statistics up there from last year, Mm -hmm. was that the science was daunting and that everybody said it, that it was really hard and they didn't know a lot of it. We get that feedback from kids. And and that's where we take, because we do get... um, examples of what they were assessed on and we begin to align that with our curriculum so there's those pieces that we have to pay attention to yeah and it's the same thing at the elementary level when the fifth graders take it we're looking at what kind of science instruction they're getting up till fifth grade and then when they take it again in eighth grade what is what are the knowledge the skills and the understandings that we're asking kids to engage in when they get to that eighth grade level as well so and yet um, you don't want to teach the test because you want to your curriculum is good instruction is good instruction right right so right right so, I think, yeah. so we're going to ask Betsy to give us some uh, an overview of um, the uh, CMT. Likewise, we haven't quite done it in this fashion, but we are going to engage principals in these conversations, Matt and I, but also ask some of them to come forward to you to give you some ideas of their um, how they've dissected and analyzed the data and then the action plans that they're working on with their teachers. Thanks. As you may have heard this summer when the scores were finally released to districts in the public in early August, um, the commissioner did uh, share that there was a decline in performance across all grade levels and across all tests uh, in the state of Connecticut. Um, And as we look at our data, we certainly follow that same pattern in some areas um, where the scores were a little bit inconsistent. There were lots of things to celebrate, but we also did follow a similar pattern as you look at Simsbury performance, which is in blue, as compared to the state performance, which is in red. Um, One of the uh, reasons the commissioner um, shared and and something that we certainly, uh, districts and certainly the folks here in Simsbury support is that we are in a transition period from the uh, as we're implementing the Common Core State Standards in our curriculum, um, as well as getting ready for a new assessment. And while folks are paying <coughs> very careful attention on what's coming ahead, um, it does mean that teachers are very hyper focused on this new learning. Uh, it takes them offline a little bit from other types of opportunities to engage in some professional development um, that we may have already done. And not I'm saying we here in Simsbury, but I think districts across the state as we try to build the rationale for this understanding these scores. Um, and so we can really point to that as a rationale for some of the inconsistent performance that we've seen here in Simsbury, as well as our neighboring districts and certainly those throughout the, uh, throughout the state. We have lots of things that we want to highlight and celebrate, um, and some noteworthy highlights and cause for celebration include our grade five science scores, which are the highest they've ever been um, since testing began in science in 2008. We had about 91% of our students in grade five scoring at or above goal in math, huge accomplishment for us. Uh, Grade 7 scores improved in all tested areas as compared to our 2012 results. And almost 97% of our 7th grade students and almost 94% of our 8th grade students scored at or above goal in reading, which are the best results we've had in 8 years. Um, So we've certainly had steady or improved performance, and we also have had steady and improved performance in the advanced bands across all grades. The data also clearly identifies three specific areas of focus for us, and we've highlighted for those in blue, those for you in blue. Um, The first being our grade three reading performance certainly took a more significant decline than we ever anticipated. Um, We are uh, also looking carefully at our grade four math scores, which took a dip as we compare those results from previous years. And we're also looking at our grade eight writing scores, which although um, they look strong, um, it's an area that is, and we'll look at this, uh, at the data a little bit in a different way in a few slides, but it's a, a sub, it's a test that our performance has been declining over time. And we want to make sure that we take a careful look at how well our students are writing and the types of opportunities that we're providing those students uh, to write more. 
There are two things, data points, that we monitor very closely when we look at our results. Uh, the first being that target of having about 50% of our students scoring in the advanced band, and also looking at when those numbers do shift, where are students falling, what bands are students falling out of. And so we happen to notice uh, more students falling in our proficient bands in grades three and four than we would like to see. Um, but yet we have some really nice steady performance with students maintaining uh, that 50% are higher in those advanced bands. Uh, looking at math, you can see that nice trend in grades five, six, seven, and eight. In reading, uh, we have really high numbers with 66% of our students scoring in the advanced band in reading in seventh grade, um, and 60% of our students scoring in the advanced band in writing in seventh <coughs> grade. So those are things we're very proud of. And as Erin mentioned, we're still in the process of digging through this data. This data just became available to districts um, around August 9th. Um, and teachers are have their hands in this data, they're working with their principals, they're working with their grade level teams, and really looking at the students who've moved from band to band and taking a look at the students who are scoring in the proficient bands. Um, as Erin mentioned, who are these students? What, changes did we have in the curriculum that may have impacted performance? Um, what are some subgroups of students that we have to pay careful attention to? So we are really mining this data to make good sense of what these shifts mean for us. As we look at our math performance over time, um, it certainly shows solid performance in math, especially in grades five through eight. Uh, we're really proud of the results we had in grade five, where we scored third in our DERG. Uh, the green shading represents an increase um, in the performance uh, in grades five and seven as compared to this 2012 results. So that's where we saw an increase in looking at that annual performance. The data also shows the performance of different subgroups of students. So these are not the same students it's just how students tested at the particular grade. Um, but the data does give us information about our curriculum and instruction. So one of the areas that we're targeting, and you see it encircled in red, is our grade four math results, where we took a more significant dip as we would have liked as compared to our DERG performance, as well as uh, looking at that state trend. Um, and that's something that we're mining and looking at the students carefully, looking at our intervention plans. These students are now in fifth grade. So not only are we just looking at the curriculum that is being taught, um, the instructional strategies that teachers are using, but also looking at how we can support these students who have moved on to fifth grade. One, Erin, could you go back for just one slide? Thank you. Um, I just want to point out that in grade six, that is the one grade level where we implemented a Common Core aligned curriculum last year. So that is an area where we knew that we needed to be part of this uh, transitional process. So we needed to roll out that curriculum in grade six so students would be adequately, adequately prepared when they took the Smarter Balance Assessment in the middle school. Um, and we're pleased with that performance, but it is a bit of, it's a small decline from where we were last year, um, but somewhat to be expected because of our focus as we look ahead in implementing those Common Core Standards. Vertical scale scores allow us to look at student growth over time, so we can look at cohorts of students, so we tend to look at them over a three-year period. So if we look at the current grade five students and we go back to their performance in third grade, we can see that as a result of these vertical scale scores, our students are making nice and steady progress over the years. And these are the same groups of students that we monitor and we measure their performance to make sure that they are, we are closing the gap and they are making that anticipated growth. And we couldn't resist but putting a gold star next to the results of our grade five science. We are thrilled. And this is no easy task for teachers and our fifth grade teachers who really are charged with delivering a really intense and rigorous curriculum in fifth grade, but also providing opportunities for review for their students because they do have to remind and refresh the skills that they've learned and the content that they've learned since third grade and fourth grade as well. So our teachers were wonderful about providing opportunities for students to come in for clubs, to stay in for recess, and got very creative in finding great ways to reinforce some previously learned concepts. And um, the 87% of our students scoring at that standard in grade eight in science as well is something to be very proud of. Well, it's working. It's working. Yeah. The strategy will continue to, to put and keep in place. Uh, our reading scores, our 2013 reading scores show uh, strong performance in grades five through eight. 
Uh, the green shading that you see on this, the uh, right-hand side of this uh, graph here, of this chart here, uh, shows that we have maintained at least 90% of our students scoring at or above goal in grades 6 through 8 for the past four years. And that's stellar. And so while our students have had some inconsistent performances in reading in the primary grades, by the time they get to grade 6, and this is something we're trying to figure out, why in grade 6, why in grade 7, why in grade 8 are we maintaining that performance at very, very high levels? So they're getting there. <coughs> what's happening in those primary, those younger grades, those um, earlier grades that may be getting in the way of that stellar performance that we're seeing later in the students' uh, years in our elementary school and into the middle school. Again, this is the uh, vertical scale uh, performance over as we look at the cohorts of students over time. Um, and this, while the 2013 data shows some inconsistent performance in grades three, four, and five, clearly our cohorts of students are making steady progress from year to year and are showing great growth in their reading skills. As we look at writing, I just want to remind you that there are two parts to this test. This is the, in the past, you've had a little quiz where we've given you a question on uh, your editing and revising skills and asked you to select the right answer. We're not going to do that tonight. But I just want to remind you that makes up part of this assessment as well as the holistic score, which is a student's writing sample where they're asked to write to a prompt. So these scores represent the total of those two subtests. Um, these are very solid scores across the grades with incremental growth in grades four and seven where we saw a bit of an increase as we compared our performance from 2012. Um, and we ranked third in the DERG in grades five, six, and seven. This slide shows you our average holistic scores, looking at how students have performed from 2010 to 2013. Um, we've highlighted for you the right-hand column, which shows our 2013 results. And so these scores range from 2 to 12. And so the fact that our average scores are is a 9, a 9.2, 9.4, 9.3 is exceptional. One area that we focused on that I mentioned earlier that we're targeting as a focus area for our work is our grade 8 writing. Because if you look at the writing, the average writing holistic score over time, it's not going in the upward direction. It's actually going in a downward direction. And so while we have some hypotheses around why that might be, um, it's certainly going to be something that Brian White will come back and talk to you about his thinking around this data, around this trend, um, and some action steps that he's going to be putting in place this year to address that. Helen, I'll turn this part over to you. OK, great. So. Um, I only have a few slides to talk with you about tonight. And primarily that is because we'll do a little bit more of an analysis when we meet together for my special ed review. So um, I do want to remind you that uh, most of our students take, uh, students with disabilities take a standard CMT or CAPT. And that means the standard assessment, most likely with accommodations to make that assessment more accessible to them. Um, some students take a modified assessment which is aligned with grade level standards, but the format makes it again much more accessible to students who average probably typically skills two to four grade levels behind and there are certain um, criteria they must meet from the state in order to take an MAS assessment. And then we have our skills checklist students, again downward extensions of grade level standards, but certainly very modified in how that assessment is given. So um, we have about 3.9 percent of our total population taking um, alternative assessments. The benchmark for the state is 3 percent. So we're a little high as far as how many students are actually taking alternative assessments. Um, so that should be addressed when we move to Smarter Balance because that test supposedly is going to be accessible for all students without taking alternative assessment. Okay? Just because of the way it's delivered, like more computerized? It's just, uh, computer yes. Adaptive. Yep. It's, and so it sort of assesses you as you enter into it gotcha. and will modify the assessment accordingly, as far as we know. But we don't know a lot about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're, we're staying tuned, you know. Um, so this is combining our scores for CMT and CAPT. Uh, and so what I really want to stress with you, when Betsy and Aaron presented their scores for students taking CMT and CAPT and the 90 percent 
students achieving goal or better, our special ed students are included in that analysis in those scores. So that's very positive. Um, so students who took the standard CMT, students with disability, disability who took the standard CMT are included in those assessment scores that were presented. This particular slide shows of the students who took the assessment, standard assessment, the percentage that met goal, and we do like to look at the percentage that are proficient. That's, that's an important marker, although we're not checking that with the state necessarily anymore. It's still important to know that most of our students with disabilities are proficient in those areas. And many are, you know, our target is about 50% and we're, we're just about there. Uh, writing is the one area where we're not. Remember that that's an assessment that we don't have an alternate MAS assessment for. They have to take the standard assessment there, so we would expect that it is a little bit lower. Um, but when we look at the data, it is writing across the board that we have our most concern about. So this is uh, compares your grade level performance of last year to this year's class. Uh, so we're pretty pleased that we're maintaining high levels in grades seven and eight. Those are very significant scores for students with disabilities. Uh, and again, that's I think a large reason why we're at that 90 percent. You know, it includes our students with disabilities. And so we also note that our earlier grades, just as Betsy explained, there are lower scores. And when we do think about it, that students with disabilities enter into special education, even enter into SRBI um, intervention at that earlier grades, and they're just getting intervention, intervention, and we hope that we do see increased scores as we go through the years. We might expect to see lower scores for students with uh, identified disabilities who are just entering into our special education services at the lower grades. So last year, Matt and I presented to you um, the NCLB <coughs> waiver where um, this brought forward those district performance indexes and school performance indexes. And what this waiver indicated is that it was looking and capturing performance across all bands and graduation rates, but with particular focus on subgroups. And there were five subgroups that um, we were asked to pay close attention to. Students with disabilities, ELL, English language learners, free and reduced lunch, black and Hispanic. So we have some uh, data points here that we'll show with show to you right now. Our comparison, Simsbury performance with those against our DERG, our reference group. So when we look at special education students and their performance on the CMT in math, reading, and writing, we are outperforming those other special ed students in um, similar communities. However, our English language learners were not faring so well in math and reading. Writing seems to be pretty consistent, but we need to dig deeper. We need to look at who these kids are. We know who they are, but figure out why they're not performing um, on math and writing. And math Do the and number reading. of those students change, or they, has that been pretty consistent? We've seen a decline in our overall numbers of ELL students, um, and it's, it's a moving target. Um, I was expecting um, about five additional students this year and they moved they stayed wherever they went to visit over the summer um, or they decided not to come so it's just a number that um, you can never project exactly but it we're actually seeing a decline as we look at those numbers how many over do time. you think we have uh, I we are probably down to about I'd say 40 Five to fifty students so at this point. One or two it's students. Really hard this to is goes back. Small right. Yeah. It does make a difference. And that's overall not even in the test degree. Right. But so still what's worth in, looking what's at. In, I'm sorry. Someone else was asking a question. I think. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just encouraging them to keep looking mm -hmm. at it. I'm not dismissing the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, just what are the any initial insights as to this is a per, pretty dramatic um, variation from who we compare ourselves to any initial insights as to what might be behind this? Well, I think that's, well, you work closely with the ELL sure. teachers, so. Sure, yeah, I think what's important to note is that, you know, behind these numbers are students, and um, if students have been in our country for 10 months of less, or 10 months or less, we don't have to test them, but after that, we do. So they may have been in the U.S. for 
two years and we have to sit them in front of this test and, and they take it and they do their very best. So we have a lot of our students actually scoring in the proficiency band, but this is the goal target that we're looking for. So they're making really nice progress when you look at their overall performance, um, but we obviously want more of them to go get them to goal. Um, but we do have a handful of students and a handful matters when you're looking at a small number of students who haven't been with us very long. And it takes them more time to acquire those skills and you just don't know how that compares to other district students who, are, who have identified ELL students. They may have had students who have been here longer and are just taking a little bit more time to acquire the language and, and meeting the standard. And I think we'll be able to bring more information back because principals are talking with their teachers as they're looking at their data. They're not just looking at how the group performed, but they're going deeper into the subgroup performance as well. Mm -hmm. So really looking at who those kids are. So that's what we intend to bring back is some more information to try to figure out exactly who those kids are and what might be contributing to these. Because it's something that really makes you stop and say, mm -hmm. we gotta pay attention to this, mm -hmm. um, where we might not have done that in the past. Right. Our free and reduced lunch students um, do extremely well in math as compared to our uh, counterparts in our uh, district reference group. Reading uh, doing well and writing a very consistent uh, performance. And again, these are very high level views of the data. This is not, like I said, there's a number of kids that fall into each one of these bars and it's important to go in and take a look at each one of them individually. And this um, slide is inclusive of our black and Hispanic students. And again, we're doing well in, ref in comparison to our reference group, but again, trying to figure out where we can continue to do even better. So the goals um, that are being developed and designed at our school levels are asking teachers to pay close atten attention to these five subgroups as well. This comparison uh, is a very similar chart to the one we started our presentation with tonight as we looked at the CMT scores, but it includes the addition of a green line graph. And that green line graph represents the DERG B districts and those average scores of those districts as well. And you'll notice as you study that and look at that, those lines, Simsbury follows a very similar pattern to the DERG as well as to the state, uh, with the exception of the three areas that we've highlighted for you tonight throughout uh, our presentation, which is grade three reading, as shows a, a decline or a, a a dip in performance, grade four math, where we fall below the DERG, and grade eight writing. And those are the three areas that we've highlighted, we've identified, we are talking with principals, principals are working with teachers, teachers are working in their teams to really get behind that and to put some solid action steps into place. Um, so the data mining is well underway. Uh, our further analysis and action plans will be shared by the principals <coughs> to you at an upcoming board meeting later this fall where they will uh, share what those actions are that they're taking in their buildings and grade levels are taking in, uh, in their, with their teams. Um, we received these results in late August, a month later than usual, and we need a little bit more time to examine this data a bit further to really peel back those layers and to really drill down to who these students are. We want to examine the data and identify students who shifted bands, as I mentioned earlier, and we want to compare that movement uh, to their 2012 performance on these assessments. We want to analyze subgroup performance and those receiving intervention to make sure that we have the right intervention plans in place and get the right students identified who might need additional support uh, and get that up and running, and that actually just started. Uh, this week and we're clearly taking a closer look at our cohort performance on the CMT to ensure that all students are making adequate progress uh, in those performance areas across those content areas. Our teachers are focusing their collaborative conversations and their PLCs on high leverage instructional strategies um, and determining what those effective interventions are for all of their students especially those that they need to provide some additional support. Um, and we are going to be continuing to provide our teachers with support with that job embedded coaching um, that we're so excited about that our newly hired instructional coaches in both literacy and math are there to do um, and there to support. And so that is well underway and we've, we've started those relationships between coaches and teachers um, and those partnerships are, are up and running. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought the um, ELL. It's going to be a very interesting trend to watch, that cohort, because of this NC, NCLB waiver. This was one area, and it's not just only our district that is facing this. It's, mm -hmm. it's the entire state. So this is something that mm -hmm. we will keep very in tune with.
Very good. We'll be monitoring that very carefully. Absolutely. Very good. Lydia, can I just ask one question? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would imagine that so much part of the success is for a teacher to have good data on students. Do we across all subjects and all grades, is that equal in terms of the quality data that's presented or are there vari variations to that um, along the way? Are you asking about the other data and the other assessments that teachers have that right. give them information right. over time? Um, I think we have a pretty comprehensive assessment system in place. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are really looking ahead. Uh, we've been given that direction by the state uh, to start looking ahead at what's to come. And we're really trying to make some decisions about how to, what are the best instructional practices, what are the best assessment practices that will give us good information about our, our teaching. So teachers do have a comprehensive assessment plan for those grade levels. We're constantly making adjustments to those assessment plans as we look ahead to implement these Common Core standards. Um, but they do have the information at their fingertips to sit down in PLCs to look at how students are doing. Um, it's a fine line that we, we, you know, we're walking right now because we do need to see what's coming ahead and really shifting our energy and our focus on making those improvements um, while really focusing on good instructional practices and the core skills that students need to be successful. That's what I would add too, just, you know, as we've developed our data system over time and gone through changes, I think it's important that we don't, for lack of a better term, drown our teachers in the data. You know, we have specific high leverage data points that we know are good predictors of success and we identify those and we stay true to those and we don't, you know, those formative pieces mm -hmm. along the way are important to the teacher to make decisions, but from an analytic standpoint, they don't need to slow things yeah. slow things down. And I think we need to work through that a little bit mm -hmm. uh, as well as we've been getting more comprehensive with that over time. Okay. Good Any other questions? Thank you. Good report. Thank you very much. Good. That was a very conclusive report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. All righty, we are on to Exhibit 10, Review of the Board of Education Subcommittee Assignments. And as you know, we do this every year. We just have a very, it's the one page that we'll be discussing this evening right here in front of you. And you know our standing committees are policy, personnel, and negotiations, curriculum. And we are um, now going to be presenting before you a new committee, Communications Committee. This is something that um, we had been talking about when Matt came on board. Um, am I ahead of you? No, no. <laughs> Just a time. Um, the Communications Committee will be a new committee, and it's something that when Matt had come aboard um, last year um, as superintendent, we had talked about um, establishing Communications Committee for the purpose of um, being proactive and, and benefiting the school system since there's so much that we do need to um, discuss with media and outlets and, and, and what have you. So that will be our new committee here, especially um, in light of reform coming, education reform at Common Core. There's quite a bit of information that's got to be dispersed via school system out into, out into the public. And Martha Hogan, who is our um, our, our staff person here um, will be also the one working with um, with uh, Matt and central office in the communication. So if you um, see your names underneath each of these committees that you've been assigned to, um, if you have any question about moving committees, please let me know. But also we will need volunteers, not this evening, but you can let me know if you're interested in also being on the communications subcommittee. So, um, so that's that's there, and below you, you have the temporary committees and the liaison committees. So please review, look at that, and let me know if uh, if there are any changes. But um, basically, we've got a very big year ahead of us, and each of these committees, um, in particular, Mike's committee over here. So, yeah, <laughs> we're busy. Very busy. So that's it. All right. With that being said, um, we're at second public audience. Anyone wishing to address the board, please. State your name and address, and see. Dean Street, Director of Athletics and Student Activities up at the high school. Okay. Uh, I was just wrapping up the first day of fall sports season, and I knew there was a board meeting, so I figured I'd swing by and give you a quick report. Um, I walked in as you were giving the back-to-school report, and so along those lines, 
Um, from a student athlete standpoint, we have over 540 student athletes at the high school. Can I have you just sit so that you are in front of the microphone so they sure. can <laughs> they can help in the take that? Bit. Absolutely. So we are at um, 500 over 540 student athletes for the fall season, uh, which is pretty consistent with where we've been in the past. Um, and it was a great first uh, great first day today for a lot of our teams. We were 11 and one overall. So uh, hey, wow. a, great, a great opening day and um, just really exciting that. As I enter year two, I, this, some of the challenges that we weren't able to get to last year are still ahead, and so I, I'm looking forward to those. So um, just wanted to give you the heads up on a great opening day. Very good. Yeah, You're very, very good. You, You're welcome to come by every time. <laughs> <laughs> Put this on your calendar twice a month. <laughs> I hope to see, see more of you this year. <laughs> Can't always guarantee we're going to be a second public audience at 9, 9.18 p.m., but thank you very much, Dane. So with that being said, seeing no one else entering into public audience, I'm going to uh, ask for a motion for uh, executive session. We are going to be entering executive session to discuss attorney-client privileged communications. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Thank you.